Now, he or she who has their health has a thousand dreams. He or she who does not has only one. Yeah. And the reason that we're able to do this podcast, the reason I'm able to build businesses, the reason I'm going to take a sabbatical next year, uh, which I've never done before, uh, is because... Joe Polish, I am so thrilled to welcome you to The Better Podcast. Welcome. It's great to be here, Stephanie. Thank you. Yeah. And I have been excited about this conversation. I have wanted to have a conversation around addiction in terms of what it looks like, a real life account of what addiction can look like. And of course, you know, I've known you for a while and I'm familiar with your story in terms of how you have changed the trajectory um, of your life. So I want to talk about your story and then just also peeling apart um, and dismantling what addiction really is uh, and almost like shape sorting, you know, like what some of the acceptable forms of addiction, some of the unacceptable forms um, of addiction. And I think my hope with our conversation today is that this is going to help our listeners have a better understanding of how we can approach addiction. Maybe they want to have a little bit of a harder look in the mirror and say, oh, you know what, maybe I have some of those more acceptable, you know, forms of addiction and how we can begin to, how we can begin to heal. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a, it's a complex subject and uh, a lot of views on it. Yeah. Good. All right. So a lot of experience as a, as a drug addict, as a, as a, uh, behavior addict. And I can talk about what that means by behavior because there's, you know, I've never met someone who's just a singular addict of alcohol or drugs or sex or gambling or food or workaholism or internet. Uh, usually it's, it's intermixed with a bunch of stuff because addiction is a solution. Uh, that's my view. And I'll go a little deeper in what I mean by that because that sounds crazy. It's not a very good solution, but it is a solution temporarily from pain. Yeah, and I, and I like that. So I let's actually start with a little bit of context because I think, you know, I know who you are. Of course, you've known my my partner Giovanni for many years and, you know, you're a millionaire, multi, you know, many times over you have this beautiful community called the Genius uh, Network. Um, but the I would love for you if you're okay with it to start with maybe your origin story because it isn't all, you know, you, I mean you live a very uh, busy, exciting, purposeful life now, but I think that it wasn't necessarily always like that. So just to provide context for our listeners, where tell me a little bit about your upbringing and your first touch points that you may have had with uh, trauma and how that may have led to uh, some of the other things that we that you were just alluding to. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I'm an entrepreneur and I've been an entrepreneur since my early 20s. Uh, and I was a uh, you know, also uh, I'm an addict, so I'm, I'm both of those things. So going back to where it kind of all started, uh, at the time we're, we're having this conversation, I'm 52 years old, and I was uh, born in 1968, and I had a mother who was a former nun. So uh, she met my father in, in, in church. Uh, she had left the convent because she had gotten ill, and we were, uh, I was born in El Paso, Texas. And what's interesting about my life is I don't have a lot of uh, great memories of my childhood. And there are entire parts of it that I literally, it's like, I, I've not been able to remember. And so my mother died when I was four, she died of what we believe to be ovarian cancer. It's really hard to even read the, the death certificate. My, my father died uh, back in 2002 uh, of lung cancer, uh, a lot of it caused by smoking most of his life. Um, and my father was really broken after my my mother died. I have an older brother, about four and a half years older than me. And when my mother died, at, when I was four years old, we lived in a small town uh, called Kerrville, Texas. And I only have a couple of memories of my mother. One, um, when I was jumping on a bed and someone had yanked me off the bed, I believe it was my father, uh, because my mother wanted me to be there. I sort of have that memory, that sense of that, but uh, it was, she had just recently had another surgery. And back then in the 70s, she died in 1972. I mean, they cut you open and her whole, she had stitches across. I just remember, you know, an image of that. And I remember being told about it later in, in life. Um, and then another time I remember, I only have two memories of my mother uh, in the, I don't know what her voice sounds like. I don't, you know, the only, I have pictures in one, uh, moving video image because back then you know everyone wasn't walking around with uh, you know smartphones and stuff so uh, I've never heard my mother's voice and which is unfortunate I would like to know what she sounded like and uh, 
there was another you know time where i don't know if it was the day she died a week before she died a few days i, I have no idea where she had tubes in her in her nose she's in a hospital bed and i was there with my father and uh and my my brother and then i remember after she had died the day she died i don't know if i was there uh, what i do remember is seeing my father outside of the um the hospital uh leaning against a tree bawling his eyes out and my father was deeply in love with my mother and my you know my, my father had a really tough life and he, he never recovered he never recovered from it so it was very broken and so our entire childhood we would move every two years and i was a really share uh, scared shy kid really introverted and whenever we would establish friendships in school you know, a year or two later, we would be uprooted and move somewhere else because my uh, my father could never settle down. He he was always trying to run away from the pain, the struggle, and he didn't have access to a lot of the therapy, a lot of the personal development, a lot of the things that today, you know, if you're in pain, and it, you know, and it's interesting because we have access to a lot of stuff in the world, but we are still uh, the world is filled with so much anxiety, so much depression. Um, America consumes so many. You know, and I say America because I'm I live here, so I'm more familiar with America than other other parts of the world. But uh, you know, we are a a world that consumes chemicals and drugs, prescription and otherwise. And you know, I mean, the number one killer uh, in the world from substances is uh, most people don't know this, but it's sugar first, it is tobacco second, it's alcohol third, and it's opiates fourth. And you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, you know, every year, 220, 230,000 people a year die from alcohol related conditions. Uh, you know, last year, you know, 130,000 that they can report of opiates this year, I wouldn't be surprised if it's triple that. And so in terms of deaths in America from Coronavirus, if you attach that to suicide, if you attach that to sugar, tobacco, alcohol, far greater, I mean, multiples greater. So what's the real pandemic, right? It's it, it, you know, what causes it. So there's a lot of things. So going back to my childhood, uh, bounce around a lot. And I, uh, when between the ages of eight to 10, that I can remember uh, a lot of it, again, I can't remember, I was, uh, you know, sexually abused, uh, molested, raped, paid money not to say anything. Um, so I didn't for years, didn't tell anyone anything, didn't know how to, didn't know how to make sense of it. But after that happened to me, I just remember feeling uh, tainted, feeling uh, there was something wrong with me, feeling um, so much shame, um, fear, anxiety, coupled with a lot of the fear and anxiety that I already had uh, losing my mother. And, and I have a friend, Dr. Gabor Mate, who actually lives in, in you know, Canada, Vancouver area. And uh, when I'd first uh, talked with Gabor, you know, he took me through this whole thinking process about it. I was like what do you know any four-year-olds and I was like well you know I have some friends so uh, he's, he's like well your your mother was probably sick before she just died it was and, and I again no memory of this he goes what do you think a, a child would experience at that time and I was you know rattling off what I think from an adult's perspective but trying right. to put yourself in that kid's perspective and he's you know what we came to is abandonment and then through my my life there was a lot of abandonment a lot of losing relationships uh caretakers a lot of bad things happened in the catholic church for me because i was raised catholic so i would go to catholic school in the early part of my life to the point where in high school i just completely turned away from it i mean i was so pissed at god i was so pissed at the church i was so pissed at everything and you know and so i'd spent thousands of hours praying to a a god that i never you know felt was helping me and or was protecting you. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that I even felt it was hard. And so some people are, I think, have different levels of the ability to feel faith, you know, to know what faith is. Uh, although I did have faith in terms of, uh, you know, God and different things. It's, it's interesting because here I am, you know, helping a lot of people in my life. So, you know, who I am as a person, I have my business. I've, you know, I actually have equity in quite a few businesses, but I have my core company, which is, you know, Genius Network, which is now a connection network. And my biggest goal is to you know connect people and i've never found a good way to market this uh, so i don't use it as a marketing thing I, you know i'll speak to it if, if anyone asks but it's like what i want to do is reduce suffering 
uh, my own, uh, you know, because I'm not like, oh, let me just go out and just help other people. I mean, I'm trying to help myself too. Uh, I think people that are like, I just do this because I want to serve. I mean, come on, we all want something for ourselves too. We want to feel good, right? Uh, and so I, I feel good when I'm able to connect people. I feel good when I'm connected myself. And, and, and if there's a word that explains the pursuit of all of my business and life activities, it's connection. Uh, and the, you know, the result is to reduce suffering. And then after that, help people make money and help people have a good life and help people generate clients. And, you know, I, that's why I learned marketing and all that. But really, I was totally disconnected growing up. And it's, it's interesting later in life that I ended up building you know, pretty uh, valuable connection network for a lot of people. Uh, it, it all came though, because I just, you know, I just felt so disconnected and Johan Hari, uh, the author, he has, uh, he's really the one that kind of uh, has popularized the, the same, you know, the opposite of addiction is, is connection. And so uh, it, it really is, you know, the opposite of addiction is, is connection. And, and uh, we live in a, a world right now that is uh, more connected electronically, but we're so disconnected uh, physically and, and amongst other things. So, yeah, so I bounced around to different parts of Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. Um, during the same time that I was being, you know, sexually abused uh, in this small town called Alpine, Texas, I also was trying to play sports and I had a sadistic little league coach that would force me to hold the baseball bat straight up. I couldn't even lean it back and I couldn't hit the ball that way. And I don't remember him doing this to any of the other kids. And I was yet, I was not yet a troublemaking opinionated kid. I was just a shy little kid. I don't know why he singled me out, but this could have been my perspective from the, the little I remember, uh, but it seemed that way. I seemed like I had, like I was getting bullied all the time. So I ended up quitting uh, the, 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 the team. And then all the other kids started picking on me and beating me up and stuff, a few of them, but I couldn't play the game. And so it was frustrating. And I only had, you know, I had a, a well, according a, to him, his way, you couldn't play it according to him. Yeah. According to him. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, I was fine if he, w- if he wouldn't like interfere with me, but he did. And so it, it, to this day, it ruined my liking of sports. I mean, I have a lot of friends that are professional athletes, but I, I never played sports again. I never liked it. I never got into it. I, I you know, hate it. I understand why people bond with sports, but it's, I look back at this and I look at it from the lens. I have a friend uh, who I met at uh, the Spartan World Championships where I was one of the speakers. A guy named Joe DeSena started this organization called Spartan. And he asked me to come speak at, at the World Championships. And so I went up there and I met another guy who was speaking there, Dr. Don Woods, who used to be a former hockey player. And we were talking about addiction and he you know, was doing a panel and he got up and he's like, you know, Joe Polish is the only guy that I've met that has what I think is the correct view of addiction, which I thought was incredibly nice for him to say. And of course, I don't know that because I've heard a lot of people I think have incredibly good insights on addiction. So I'm not here to present myself as quote unquote, like an expert, you know, in in everything. I just have my experience with it. And I'm I'm happy to share that. Uh, He used a term though, when when, uh, Don Woods was speaking, he said, if you looked at the atmospheric conditions of somebody's life, it makes sense why they do what it is they do. And I really like that framing because the atmospheric conditions of my childhood make sense how I ended up doing and engaging in the things good and bad that I've done as an adult. And so when I see someone, uh, a person, a community, a country, a globe, you just look at the atmospheric conditions of what the hell is going on. And a lot of this makes sense. You know, if you're, we're sitting here right now, but if a freaking airplane flew through my building right now, if it was on fire, if someone came in with machine guns, the atmospheric conditions, I would freak the hell out. No matter how much recovery I've done, I'd have to contend with it, right? And different people right now in the world from single mothers to people that have lost jobs to people that are at war. I mean, there's there's some difficult things. And so what do people do when they have different pain? They either respond to it, if they can respond, or they react to it. And when you're reacting to life, you know, at least from my perspective, that's the word I would use. Uh, My life doesn't work well. When I'm responding to life, my life does work well. And so I had, uh, you know, I had this, this dog when I was uh, a kid named uh, Panther. It was a black Labrador. All this bad stuff's happened to me at this time in my life, you know, 10 years old. And I come home one day and my father had given my dog away for some reason. And, you know, my, and, and I, I, you know, I, I, I hate to say bad things about my father. I'm not trying to say he, he, his atmospheric conditions sucked. 
The guy lost the love of his life. He was left with these two little kids. He, it was, there's a saying that you'll sometimes hear in 12 step groups that is, um, you know, God never gives you more than you can handle. It's kind of like a cute saying. Um, rehab centers and hospitals are filled with people that got more than they could handle. You know, mental institutions are filled with people that got more than they can handle. So there, there are things that we get more than we can handle. And that was uh, too much for me to handle. And I just became really uh, just messed up, really fucked up. And no one knew it, though. And I didn't know it, though. That was my, you know, I, I was only able to look back later. It's like, oh, no wonder I started doing drugs. No wonder I started getting high every day. No wonder I started shoplifting when I was a kid. No wonder when I was doing drugs, I was dealing drugs to try to make money to support my drug habit. You know, and I, uh, yeah, so it, so it was, uh, it was, it was difficult. That's where it started And the drug abuse, just to kind of tell the story. I, I first started getting high, uh, smoking pot and that, and then, you know, being in along the way, when you are doing drugs, the people you do drugs with are also doing drugs and it becomes, those are your friends, you know? Chris Rock has this skit that I've always thought was funny years ago where he's like, if you're a crackhead, you find other crackheads. You, you know, if you're a crackhead, you're not married to someone who wakes up and puts on a suit and goes to work at 5 a.m. You're married to another crackhead, something like that. I'm not saying it exactly right. But I, I always thought, yeah, you know, your circle, your environment supports the, the behavior that you, that you have. And I don't think of good habits or bad habits. I think of just habits. If you wake up every morning, you... Uh, you know, smoke a pack of cigarettes, drink three cups of coffee, eat an Egg McMuffin, kick your dog, yell at your wife and kids. Uh, and you do that consistently every day. You just have really good habits of doing that. So, you know, the way we live is, is and you the, probably know other people who do the exact same thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. So I started doing drugs and, uh, you know what it, it took me from a very shy, introverted, scared person to becoming very open and very social and bizarrely, for a short period of time, I became one of the most popular people in my high school. Everyone thought I was cool and I felt cool and I felt free. And it, you know, it, it was awesome until it wasn't awesome anymore. Because, you know, what is addiction? I mean, there's many ways to define it. Um, and, and there's, you know, a, a therapist or a doctor can speak to the biochemical aspects of addiction. But I would just describe addiction as uh, anything that you can't stop doing, uh, you know, anything that you're, that, that you, 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 a behavior, a consumption that uh, you cannot stop doing, that you want to do or that you don't want to do, that you cannot stop, that has negative consequences and has compulsivity attached to it. So there's a lot of people that will say to me, isn't everyone addicted to something? And I'm like, you know, actually, I don't think so. I, I'll usually go along with it because a lot of people just think, every, you know, someone that's really obsessive, you'll, you'll see a lot of personal development people. And I'm not saying this is right or wrong. A lot of this is semantics because I could speak to it. There are certain times where I've used the word obsession in what I would like to think are good ways, but you're like, be obsessed. You know, what are you obsessed with? You know, obsession is usually just a, a code word for I'm addicted, you know, and, and, and you'll have a lot of people that are leading people in the world in personal development that are some of the biggest addicts on the planet. They're work addicts, they're status addicts, they're narcissists, and they they have literally, and some have millions of people that follow them, and they really think that they are the all-knowing. And, uh, and and I, you know, I'm in a weird space in what I do for a living and what I do in the addiction world where I meet world-famous leaders in sometimes the most broken states. And uh, it's, it's, it's dangerous when they start thinking they, uh, they have a handle on things that they don't have a handle on. And so, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's, a, lot, there's a lot to it. So my addiction became a coping mechanism for pain. Like, again, I'll quote my, my friend Gabor Mate, where he says, uh, you know, the question is not why the addiction, but why the pain. And I didn't understand why I had the pain. I didn't even know what that was. You know, when you're, when you're a child, most addiction starts in childhood. I mean, it really does. It's trauma and a lot of things happen before the age of six years old that if you really dig into it, you can see so much of the drivers here. I mean, even everything I'm saying right now, yeah, I mean, on an intellectual conscious level, there's all kinds of shit on the unconscious level that I'm not even aware of that's causing me to think the things I do, feel the things I say, 
have the biochemistry and the, you know, the serotonin and dopamine and everything that's surging through my body biochemically. I mean, so there's, there's, there's a lot to it, but, uh, uh, I will to, to, not, to not make the, every person I'm yet to meet a person that has not had some area of their life that had enormous struggle, enormous adversity, enormous pain. So even though I question sometimes when I tell the story, I'm not doing it to have anyone feel sorry for me. Uh, hopefully the only thing that happens is it becomes relatable and you understand that you're as sick as your secrets. And when I spent my life uh, trying to hide my secrets, my life sucked. And the moment I started talking about it, uh, first in recovery groups, 12 step groups and other types of groups and therapy, uh, it started, I started becoming more free. Uh, I'm not a big proponent of going on Facebook and doing confessionals if you've not spent time with trusted people there's a big difference between secrecy and privacy. And there are certain things in your life that as you process them, you keep them private and you keep them with trusted people that are safe. Because a lot of times, if you go out into the world, you will get attacked. And I mean, I, I am now pretty open about some of the things I talk about and some people it makes them uncomfortable. And I don't do any of it to try to be uh, anything other than just helpful. And I also have to go into these things talking about this stuff and not get caught up in woundology because when you go to a seminar and they're like tell your you know horror story and all the bad things and use it to sell books and use it to sell seminars I mean you can become really attached to this narrative that you're a victim and you can live your life out that way and if you have a lot of people saying oh you you know it's so bad that you had to deal with that and and, and there are certain people that can come up to me that I have rapport with and can genuinely you know say say things to me you know, I'm not doing it though. Some people like feel bad for me. I'm doing it because I want everyone to look at their own life and say, what the fuck have you not dealt with that is causing you to screw up your life? That is causing you to not be a very nice person that is, you know, causing you enormous angst and pain and that you, you don't feel ever okay in the world. Cause I, I know what that feels like. I mean, the only healthy form of fear that I'm aware of is uh, concern, you know, every other form of, of fear from, terror in you know uh, like frustration is a form of anger and and fear combined you know and so there's there and you know this i mean you're you're you're, you're very familiar with this so i spent most of my life uh really not feeling okay in the world feeling like there is this dark cloud following me around everywhere and i still have that i still contend with it i'm just the recovery work though has been enormously helpful all the business deals all the money in the world never made up for that terrible empty feeling of not enough and i i feel better today in the middle of a you know yoga session than i do putting together a you know big business deal and so the question is you know what is important and how and i'm also a big believer in making money because people say money isn't important try living without it you know people that say money can't buy happiness haven't given enough of it away i buy happiness all the time right and if, you're, if you're a miserable person with you know money you can make other people happy such as someone that can't feed themselves someone that can't get medical care you know someone that doesn't have you know a, a life situation that is you know even bearable and you can you can do a lot with money. So I'm a big champion to entrepreneurship. I'd like to apply entrepreneurship to addiction recovery. What I mean by that is the orig original definition of an entrepreneur came from a French guy in 1804 was the first recorded use of, uh, of the term entrepreneur. And I learned this from Dan Sullivan at Strategic Coach, which is where me and Giovanni first met. And, um, you know, he, uh, he said, uh, entrepreneur is an individual that takes resources from a lower yield to a higher yield, uh, resources from a lower level of capability to a higher level of capability. And whenever you can take your recovery from one level, when you can take someone's thinking, someone's skills, be it marketing, finance, management, technology, exercise, fitness, health. I mean, you know, whenever you make it better, that's entrepreneurship. Uh, what I don't consider like good business practices is when you can, you know, yeah, you can use business principles in marketing to sell pornography or to sell drugs and alcohol, to sell terrible toxic foods to people. I mean, that shit's done all the time. That doesn't mean entrepreneurs are bad people. That doesn't mean, you know, uh, all business is bad. And, and, and what happens is, you know, in the world of marketing that I live, I just think of marketing as storytelling. And as crazy as it seems, I think of like, okay, if I'm gonna enroll somebody into a type of thinking or something that's good for them, 
you have to do it with marketing. Marketing is messaging. Marketing is what you say and who you say it to. It's not an industry or a thing you choose to do. We're doing it all the time. So I'm trying to now take my marketing skills and uh, apply it to changing the global conversation about how people view and treat addicts with compassion instead of judgment and to find the best forms of treatment that have efficacy and share it with the world because you cannot punish pain out of people. And we live in a world where we're trying to punitively treat addicts and you, you know, you're, you, you're, you're, you're never going to punish pain out of people. And the criminal justice system right now is kind of in charge of what to do with addicts when they've done bad things and it needs to be a more compassionate industry. And I'm not even sure that should be the medical industry because so many doctors you know, are, are drug dealers. Uh, and, 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 and a lot of them don't even know it. They just don't know any better. They're the, the, the system. Well, that's their, that's their philosophical premise, right? So, you know, we were talking about Patrick Gentempo who talks about this. It's like your philosophical premise is going to be the operating system in which you, in which you live. Right. So if you are a medical doctor and you think, well, if I give this person this statin or this SSRI, and that's going to alleviate their symptoms, you are coming from a place where you think that you are doing good in the world. But if you, if there's an opportunity to maybe look at other interventions that maybe also don't have as much, maybe there's not as many randomized control clinical trials or meta-analyses, but we see a lot of low level points of evidence, a lot of case studies like breath work or meditation. You mentioned yoga, you know, getting into, and this is something I find for the women that I tend to work with, um, but across the board, especially in entrepreneurship, we like to live in our heads. We don't like to go beneath the throat, like in the body sometimes can be very scary. And to your point, this is often where trauma lives. Like I think there's many men and women who've endured, you know, a myriad of tra- like big T trauma, little T trauma, however you want to, you know, the sexual abuse, as you've been alluding to the physical abuse, there's, you know, um, not feeling we had Nicole LaPera on the podcast and she was sort of broadening the depth, like she's known online as the holistic psychologist. And she was broadening the term of trauma as not feeling seen or heard or understood by your parent or having your parent, you know, vicariously live through you or, you know, controlling your behavior or telling you that you were, you know, overweight or not good enough, you know, smart enough or whatever in some not enough in some way. So all of these things, and I hear you talking about your story and there's so many elements of that. So you've talked about this, you know, being uprooted several times. You've talked about sexual abuse um, when you were, you know, 10, the sadistic uh, coach uh, that you had, and then the peers and the bullying. And yet I still hear compassion for your father. You know, like this is really a hallmark of someone who's done the work where you can say like, I understand where he was coming from. And I think so often when we're thinking about trauma, we think about it from the first person singular. This happened to me. This happened on me. This was something that was imparted on me. But I think that the, I love, I mean, obviously my heart breaks to hear that you've, you've had to endure some of these very difficult lessons. But what I also hear is that you've also adopted more of a third person. You know, I, I, I liken it to, um, you know, I've spoken on the podcast before about my experience with psychedelics and my own, you know, working through my own traumas from my, from my childhood. When I first did MDMA for the first time before that, it was always like my father beat me up. He, he was doing something to me, but after several sessions of, you know, this particular psychedelic with, you know, my, um, the healers that I was working with, I was able to understand his own traumas, his own operating system, how he was coming to the table as a father, what he had been taught from his surroundings that, you know, children should not be, should be seen, but not hurt, you know, that kind of thing. So when, you know, big loud Stephanie's like running around the place and is like, you know, disrupting his paradigm, like that's what he was trying to, to restore. Well, you know, yeah, there, you, you bring up a lot of thoughts uh, in my mind about all kinds of, uh, of different perspectives with, do you remember uh, Sean Stevenson? Yes. yes. Yeah. I don't know if you were ever friends with Sean. I didn't know him personally, but I, I knew of him. I know Alex Sharfin, who's a friend of mine, knew him very well. I know you knew him very well. Yeah. 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 Well, Sean was my best friend and mm-hmm. uh, he moved to Arizona to be close to me and um just an amazing guy. He, for people that don't know him, uh, spelled Sean, S-E-A-N, Stevenson, S-T-E, 
P-H-E-N-S-O-N. He, uh, cause there's another Sean Stevenson that we are also friends with that's spelled completely different. He's like a sleep doctor and whatnot. And um, Sean, uh, I've heard the same before, uh, which you know you have and you're just talking about it, which is this is not happening uh, to me, it's happening for me. And the last words that Sean said when he was at the hospital, um, which was last year, uh, I got a call from him on FaceTime and he had just fallen out of his wheelchair. He was a three foot tall little guy in a wheelchair who never walked a day in his life because he had a brittle bone condition and uh, he had had over 200 broken bones in his body before the age of 18. And his parents, uh, you know, Gloria and Greg uh, Stevenson and then his wife, Mindy Kniss, um, you know, dear friends with all of them. And um, I'd known Sean for many years, you know, at least, geez, probably 15, 17 years, maybe. And um, yeah, at least. And Sean had five years prior, almost to the day of this accident, he had also fallen. Uh, he, had, he was walking at a new dog in, in his wheelchair. I guess you couldn't even say walking. He would make jokes about that. He's like, I don't really walk the dog. I wheel the dog. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, had the leash tied to a wheelchair and something spooked the dog and, and the dog like ran and it tipped the wheelchair over and he had broken, uh, he had a, a fracture in his skull, bleeding on the brain three breaks in a femur, broken ribs, and we thought he was going to die. And he recovered, and that was five years prior. And so I get a call from him on FaceTime. He's like, he can see he's in pain. He's like, can you come meet me at the hospital? I had a, my, I had a new wheelchair that tipped over and, you know, got to go in. And so I thought he was going to be okay. And so I go to the hospital. And by the time I get there, he's on pain meds, uh, and he's just – kind of going in and out of consciousness. And his wife's there on the other side of the bed, a couple of uh, Sean's, like um, a guy that worked with was there. And so, you know, we're talking to him and I get another friend of mine who's an emergency room physician on FaceTime and we're looking through, you know, the MRI and, you know, going over with the doctor, what's going on with him. And they're like, we're gonna have to air vac him and take him to a trauma hospital. and. So, you know, I'm talking to Sean saying, hey man, just hang in there, buddy. And uh, his wife's on the other side of this bed, you know, this kind of a, on wheels in an emergency room. And he is in sort of this kind of like out of its state and just comes sort of alive is the best way that I can say it. And he's like, you know, this, this is happening, you know, for me. Uh, but I didn't hear him say that. I'm like, what? And he's like, this is happening uh, for me, not to me. And then immediately goes back into this, like, it's almost like he just wanted us to hear that. And that was the last words that I heard Sean say. And then they had to wheel him back, prepare him to, you know, and then go to this trauma hospital. And I drive my car, everyone else drives down to they, you know, uh, they, they, they air vacuum this place. And so we get to this hospital and, uh, you know, we think he's just, you know, we talked to the neurosurgeon. I explained to him, I'm like, this is one of the most incredible people on the planet. He influences millions of people. Like he's a, this is an amazing, you know, just cause we're just know the significance of this individual. And of course he's significant to us cause we you know, love him and uh, they come out. I don't know how long it was, but it was uh, you know, a little over an hour and we're in the waiting room, just waiting to hear that, you know, Sean's going to be okay. And the neurosurgeon comes out with a whole team of doctors behind him. And I immediately knew that, Oh shit. This is not good. Yeah. He basically told us that they, when they opened up his, his skull, uh, the pressure, uh, it, it exploded and they did CPR. They tried to revive him, but he, uh, he coded and he died. And it's the first time that this neurosurgeon had someone die on an operating table in 30 years. And uh, I mean, it was terrible. And the, what I took away from it though, is that what he said, you know, and I'd heard that before, but in that environment and in that context, in someone, he, it's almost like Sean, just to, to the day he died, took that with him. And that guy has endured shit that I can't even imagine. Like the pain, like he was funny, he was loving, he was caring. And yeah, he would have meltdowns. We would both have meltdowns. And whenever we needed to cry to each other and stuff like that, he'd be one of those guys that I could do that with. And there's very few that, that I had that level of rapport with. And, and Sean everyone felt like Sean was their best friend. He was such an incredible guy, but he, 
he built himself that way in a shell of a body that I could not even imagine. I mean, my levels of insecurity and self-esteem issues and crap that I deal with, you know, I just sit and think about, you know, what would Sean do? And so the point is, I use it as in a very inspiring way. And, and to this day, you know, he inspires so many people. He wrote a great book called Get Off Your Butt, B-U-T, not B-U-T-T, -T, because he never walked, right? It's a great title. And, um, you know, he's got a lot of videos and just put a, put a lot of great stuff into the world. But I, you know, I've done my best. And, and so to go back to your point about my father, yeah, there are many years I was pissed at my father. And there are certain times where I still have to work through resentments that I have. Of course, yeah. And I also am like, you know, man, he got dealt uh, a lot in life that just was unfortunate. I mean, he, you know, he had a rough life and to lose, you know, I don't know what it's like to lose someone in the way that he lost someone. I have my own way of knowing what loss feels like. And I've had a lot of loss lately. You know, last year was one of the worst years I've had in a decade. You know, I had valley fever, which is a, something you get in Arizona. I never gotten it before, even though I've lived in Arizona most of my adult life. I had a breakup of a relationship that was very painful. Um, I had Sean die. I had another friend die two months after that. Uh, I had one of the biggest business betrayals I've ever experienced in my life from someone who I helped tremendously for years and then you know, decided to uh, you know, steal from me and be a thief. And so that was very difficult and I had to work through a lot of stuff and then it bled right into the pandemic. And then, yeah. you know, all the, but I'll tell you, all the recovery work, when you, when you do recovery, you learn about powerlessness. And there's a lot of things in the world that are you have no power over. And you know, I've said the serenity prayer. Even if you're an atheist, it's a great prayer. You know, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom uh, to know the difference. <laughs> and I'll say it occasionally from a book I read years ago, a funny uh, book called Meditations for Miserable People That Want to Stay That Way. <laughs> <laughs> I love that title. <laughs> so good. Oh, and right. he has. He has a serenity prayer where he's like, God, grab me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know that I can't do either. Oh, that's funny. So, oh, that's gold. I like sarcastic humor and stuff. And humor, uh, when Same things way. suck, find a way to laugh. Because yeah. life is painful a lot at times. And everyone's going to go through stages where they're confident and things are working and you're in a loving relationship and you're feeling healthy. And there's other times where you're desperate and you're scared and you're self-centered and you, you know, you're, you're in many cases destructive to yourself and destructive to other people. And, you know, the more that we, uh, you know, having your heart ripped out of your chest sucks. And at the same time, you're going to go through it and you're going to lose loved ones and people are going to die and you're going to be sick at times. And so, you know, I, I constantly think about, you know, in, in my, my business, I, I try to sell people what they want, which is usually more money and more clients, but I try to give them what they need, which is connection. And I, uh, you know, we focus on health, wealth, and health, you know, things that are uh, mental and physical health. Uh, I have a friend named Krishnan Kadachini who lives in Canada. He, uh, he, he's the one that first told me this proverb, uh, which is, uh, I, I now say he or she, just to be, you know, uh, politically correct, even though political correctness is fucking nonsense um so um you know he or she who has their health has a thousand dreams he or she who does not has only one yeah. and the reason that we're able to do this podcast the reason i'm able to build businesses the reason i'm going to take a sabbatical next year uh which i've never done before uh is because i'm not laid up in a hospital bed and so i'm very grateful when i have my health because there are times in my life i've not had my health physically and there have been times where i've not had my health mentally you know i mean I, I was a very functioning addict but I, most of my adult life was living in angst in fear and never being happy uh with uh, other than for short bursts of times and i would try to escape from this pain through addictive behavior and trying to feel safe and uh yeah um i can keep babbling but i, I want to Oh, you're not, you're not babbling. I think what you're, what you're talking about is gold. And I, I think there's, what I like about what you're saying is that there's nuance to the human condition. I think that there's so many, you know, you'd use the term like life coaches. So we'll just kind of use that all encompassing term or the woundology type of, you know, victimization where everyone's like, you have to be happy. You know, you get to the happy place. Like, you know, and it's like, you know, sometimes you can party with your inner bitch, you know, your inner moody, oh, yeah. lazy sloth, 
you know, that person also has a seat at the table and there's going to be in the way that you said, like, I still have to work through anger and, you know, these deep seated neuro, this deep seated feeling that I have in my nervous system where, you know, towards my father and you can also have compassion and a sense of forgiveness around why he did the things he did, because you understand now as an adult that he didn't have the tools that he, that you would have, that you needed him to have when you were little. So I, I, I like what you're saying and I'm, you know, maybe I'm speaking for you. So correct me if I'm not, but what I'm hearing you say is that there's nuance. And I think that that's an important thing to consider when we're talking about addiction, when we're talking about the pursuit of anything, whether it's entrepreneurship and success and being in a, in a business or it's health, there's going to be times, like you said, where you feel great, you have lots of energy, the mitochondria are on point. And then there's times where you're going to wake up on the wrong side of the bed. Everything's going wrong. You wonder why, like you're crazy for being in this business. Or you think, why have I put in all this effort just to see this small little progress there? But that's, that's part of the human existence. And I think that we are as a society and I'm painting some generalizations here, but I think that they're valid ones is that we don't want to feel our feelings. And I think as it, as it pertains to the conversation around addiction, you know, you were talking about Dr. Gabor Mate, who I absolutely adore his work. And he has, you had said, you know, he, he has talked about this idea as addiction, as a solution to a problem. And you, you said a couple of times in, um, you know, that addiction is the attempt to connect to something. It's yeah. just what we are trying to connect to is not necessarily a long-term strategy. It's going to hurt. maybe in the short term, it gives us temporary relief from pain or it gives us a sense of belonging or love or acceptance or inner peace or whatever it is. But in the long term, it destroys you. Um, so I, I, I really appreciate what you're saying because I think that um, I think that, that that nuance is really lost when we talk about addiction because we like to classify, like when we think of addiction, we're like, okay, it's the guy in the back alley heating up the spoon. You know, it's like the drug addict or, you know, it's the, you know, it's the baby, the crack baby or whatever. And while those things are true, there's also the workaholics. There's also the type A personalities that push themselves beyond their physical limits. There's also shopaholics. There's also sexaholics, as you talked about. There's also you know, obsessively, uh, or, you know, addictively, maybe is a better word, checking Instagram or Facebook or whatever it is. Right. So we have to be thinking about all the different ways and permutations that addiction can come up in someone's life and having some, and may, and maybe you can speak to this a little bit, you know, in terms of how you learn to have a little bit more compassion for yourself. Cause I think that that's where it needs, I mean, I, I, I see the compassion you have for your, your father, but I think you also have to have on some level, some compassion for yourself because it's hard, it's, it's harder to forgive yourself for making bad choices. than I think it is someone who does some wrongdoing to you say, Oh, it's okay. You know, we say, Oh, it's okay. But when we do something wrong, like, man, I mean, maybe I'm just speaking from my own, my own internal voice. It's like, you know, the, you know, it's like the, the, the black, you know, the ruler is like, I take out the ruler and like, I beat myself up much longer than I would someone else who's wronged me. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you see, uh, if you see addicts, um, here's the difficulty with addicts, addicts in their worst state, they lie, they cheat, they steal. So, uh, you know, I, I don't believe addiction is a brain disease. I used to believe it was now I believe it's a response to trauma and there's certain, you know, studies being done, uh, on, mental illness, genetics, and things related to it. Um, and and it's, it's a very complex thing. I don't think there's one solution to it. So when people come up to me and say, I, yeah, I've got the solution for addiction. I've got the cure for addiction. It's like, well, from what I've learned from people that are way smarter than me, and I've spent a, unfortunately, I've you know been able to make money and I've spent about half a million dollars on my own recovery. And I used to try to buy the best therapist, hire the best therapist. And that was a clever workaholic uh, way of avoiding doing the real work. Like, going yeah, like check, I did it. Check. I hired the best guy. So he, I'm going to outsource it to him. Yeah. Or her. yeah. And you see that right now. And I'll tell you, like, I would have to say, you know, half of uh, the influencers that I know, at least in, in, in my world uh, are, are addicts and they're work addicts and they're status addicts and they're narcissists. 
And narcissism is a difficult one. I've become good friends with Dr. Romani Dravasala, who's one of the top narcissist experts in the world. Uh, she's she's incredible. A lot of great videos you can watch from her online. And, and uh, I've, I've interviewed her a few times, had her out at Genius Network, and she's taught me a lot about narcissists. And there's not really a, a way to fix them because they're deeply wounded. Um, they're incredible low sense of self-worth. And, and the way it, that it works its way out is not having empathy and caring about other people. And, uh, but they're really good at pretending that they do. And they can they can cry on cue, they can cry on stage, they can put out videos. And there are people that are have millions of followers that are some of the biggest narcissists you'd ever imagine. And there's a lot of communal narcissists out there that do all kinds of things to raise money for charities and stuff like that. But they would never do that if, if they weren't able to use it as part of their, you know, social media post and part of their, you know, uh, cosmetic uh, credibility building. And it's, it's a very interesting thing. I think the, I think one of the best possible um, solutions uh, and treatments of narcissism is uh, the, the, the proper use of psychedelics and plant medicines. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen some pretty hardcore narcissists who've properly done ayahuasca, MDMA guided journeys, psilocybin, ibogaine, various things like that, that have uh, dramatically improved. Uh, some that still have a ways to go, but I've, I've known some people for you know many years that I've seen some, as they get more famous, become way worse. And it really shows that the ego is driving the show. And I've seen other people that have been like, yeah, let me really, let me really evolve here. And, and of course, look, I, that's all I'm trying to do too. I, I would imagine 10 years from now, if I was to watch, you know, our conversation, I would probably be like, did I actually really say that bullshit? Did I <laughs> that? So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping in my own journey, I can continually increase you know, my level of consciousness. And I, I, one of the reasons I'm going to do a sabbatical next year is I want to really look at death. I really want to look at, um, and when I say look at death, I don't mean like in a morbid, like, let me study death. I mean, uh, there's a lot of fear that we live in American culture around dying. And then if you look at, you know, the way that like, you know, even Mexicans and like the Spanish, they have like, they say, they, you know, the Dias de los Muertos where they, they talk to the, and I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to sound crazy here, but I'm going to say it anyway. I, I speak to my grandmother, like my grandmother, my grandfather. I was just, I felt like I was talking to him. Like he died when I was three. So, you know, I don't have the same as you. I don't know what he sounds like, but I, I was, I felt like he was in the room and sometimes I'll, um, you know, try to ask like, what would, what would Cleopatra or Isis, not the terrorist group, but the goddess, the Egyptian goddess, what would she do, you know, in this, uh, in this scenario? So yeah, I, uh, I talk to, I talk to people, I no, talk no, to, no, I talk I, to I, dead I, people. <laughs> that, that's fine. Look, I mean, what, whatever allows you to feel connected and stuff as crazy as it sounds, the question is, does it work? And by the, by the way, I, I, I just quickly put myself on mute and, and I, uh, you know, muted the video since we're here on zoom okay. because I, I still have this sort of self-esteem thing with, uh, I, I was doing breathing exercises earlier. I have a friend named James Nestor who wrote a book called Breath. Bre yes, yes, yes. Mm. Yeah, such a good book. And, he, and mm. he's, he's become a friend and the guy's so smart. And he's been said to me all these things to help with, with breathing. Mm. And surprisingly, like I realized I never learned how to breathe effectively my entire uh, life. Now, I'm not going to get off the whole talking to dead people thing. I'll come right back to that. Yeah, you can, you can shelf it, but let's talk about this right yeah. now. <laughs> I, 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 wanted, I wanted to actually say there's certain things that just like I, I feel uncomfortable with. And one of them is if I ever have like a runny nose or I have to blow my nose or something. And I have a deviated septum. And so I've learned recently, like I've, and I'll tell you, you, you take uh, you, you take a smoker, like my father, uh, died of uh, lung cancer and he smoked his whole life. So that certainly uh, was not, you know, a good thing. And depending on, you know, I have a book that's going to come out with Hay House. They wanted me to publish it next year, but I told them I'm taking a sabbatical. So we have to wait till the following year. Mm. And so if you, you know, if you look at Louise Hay's stuff or whatever, you'd see like things with lungs related to grief. And so my father had a tremendous amount of grief. And if you see us, like, I hate cigarettes, right? I don't like smoke. I, even though when I was a drug addict, I smoked. Right? When I was in high school, I was smoking. When I was, you know, doing coke and uh, drinking, you know, tobacco went along with it, right? And the the interesting thing is, is when someone tells like a smoker, you know, quit smoking, what a really addicted smoker, which most of them are, if they can't stop smoking, that is addiction. 
it's like telling them stop surviving because it's one of the few activities where you take a deep breath. Yeah. It's very meditative. It's ritualized. It, 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 it relaxes them and it becomes a, a, in some ways a nervous way to deal with angst, a nervous way to, and, and it works, uh, but it kills you, right? It's terrible for you. Uh, but I look at so much of this as breathing. And how are you breathing mentally? How are you breathing physically? What allows you to breathe? What allow? And if you're walking around like a tightrope all the time. So when you have a constant fear of death in the world, where you're walking around constantly, we, we are, how often do we see death in like modern culture? Unless you're a doctor, of course, right? Or unless you're in a type of situation or you're, you know, you're, you're a hitman or something, you, you, don't, you don't, some people can go their entire lives without seeing someone die. And we fetishize youth. Right. Yeah. Right. And so we do all of this shit to try to like, and then you look at, and, and I'm no expert in this, but you know, like Tibetan philosophy, well, they'll, they'll look at this as one of the most amazing things to happen in life is that period. And so, you know, what, one of the things, um, that I realized uh, in 2015, I took a film crew uh, to, first we went to California and I had Daniel Amen um, scan my brains because Daniel's actually scanned more brains of people with addictions than any uh, brain doctor in the world. And he had first scanned my brain in 2010 when I went down there with Dan Sullivan and Babs. And, and so, you know, Daniel had joined Genius Network and, you know, he's, he's an interesting, you know, uh, very, very fascinating doctor. And, and some people love him or hate him because he's, he's been successful and he's very outspoken. Right. And so a lot of, a lot of, and he, he's in a couple of interviews I've done with him. He said some interesting things. One is that uh, psychiatry is the only profession that doesn't look at the organ that it treats. Right. You know, you I, I love that he said that you, yeah. you need, you need to objectively quantify the organ you're treating. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good one. And then the other thing he said was if you ever looked at the brains of serial killers, you would rethink the death penalty because these are sick brains. These are not normal brains. Right. And so I went down to him and I had him scan my brain. And then I, before that I did serotonin and dopamine blood tests in my body. Cause I wanted to kind of take a look at that. And then I went to Mexico because it's illegal in the United States. So I went to Mexico and uh, did Ibogaine, which is, uh, you know, one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful psychedelic in the world, uh, filmed it, took Ibogaine. And then um, that was the most scary, horrifying, intense experience of anything I had ever done for about the first five hours. And then the remaining seven hours, because it lasted about 12 hours that I was in another world, uh, was beautiful. And... I saw millions of visions and hallucinations. Now, a lot of people will see the faces and stuff and say from you know tribal use of Ibogaine that these are spirits and stuff. And what the hell do I know, right? And you're, you can do all kinds of things to uh, have yourself go into different sort of spaces consciously um, or into another realm, whatever you want to call that. I've never released the footage yet because it'll be in a future documentary, but part of it is... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at all the different ways. Like Ibogaine is one of the most effective ways to treat opiate addictions. And uh, it has a very high success rate, uh, as does many plant medicines. But I'm very careful. And I'm, this is probably even the most you'll hear me talk about this stuff. I mean, I've done interviews with Andrew Weil. And I'm friends with, you know, Paul Stam at the Mushroom Expert and Rick Doblin from MAPS. I mean, they, these guys are friends of mine. And certainly we've talked about it on stage with, you know, when I've interviewed Susie Batiste and Tim Chang. And there's like a lot of... People that openly are basically successful. rattling off my ideal podcast guest list. As you, <laughs> oh, I, I can, I can, inter I'm happy to introduce you to, to, yeah. to, to, to some of them. And uh, yeah, which ones I know will be good and which ones won't. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it's uh, so there's a lot, there's a lot of this coming in. Now, the dangerous thing though is I have a lot of friends and I've been a Birdie Man twice. I'm not like this huge, like I love Birdie Man. Uh, some of my friends that's like, they're so bummed in the midst of the pandemic. It's that's their thing, you know, to so go to Birdie Man. It's their community. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of that, the community out there. But I, you know, I have some, some people that will go to Bernie Man, get high in a camper and then call it a spiritual journey. And then there's other people that really have spiritual journeys. And there's people that, so it's not about when I mention these things like psychedelics and substances, I really wish people would hear it's, that's just one of the 
parts of the process. It, you know, Timothy Leary years ago, I think he's the one that uh, came up with the term set and setting, yeah. where you have to be in the right mindset and then it's the setting. And that's critically important with everything yes. because the environment and the guide, and there are a lot of dangerous people running around calling themselves shaman that are taking people through, you know, sort of putting them in weird situations. And so I just, if, 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 if I talk about it, I always want to caution people that it's not just go do this stuff you know don't don't sit in someone's living room and think that it's always going to be safe it could be but you know you're also dealing with stuff there's legal things there's substances that you know so but i'll tell you when you look at all the the, the drugs that save people's lives are illegal and the drugs that kill people are legal and that's the that's the fucked up bullshit about a lot of this yep. and so even I did a I did an interview with U.S. News and World Report, and and someone can just type in my name, you know, Joe Polish, U.S. News, and read the article. And I, I the 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 writer, to her credit, actually put ibogaine and MDMA when I talked about it in the interview in the article, which I thought was great. And before we we did the interview, I said, you know, uh, it was going to be on opiates, and I'm I've never been an opiate addict. I was a cocaine addict, I was a sex addict, a work addict. Uh, you know, I, I did LSD probably 75 times before the age of 18. You know, I've done plenty of psychedelics. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I was, um, you know, that was for entertainment and escapism. Today, I don't look at any of those things as like, oh, let's go get high. You know, it's like, no, this is therapeutic. You know, so I, I'm a big believer in MAPS. You know, when Rick Doblin gave his TED Talk at MAPS, I was there literally in the front at ted in person while he gave that i thought it was incredible and right. they were so afraid of like chris anderson who you know who owns ted now uh rick uh, saul warman who was the original founder of ted who i spent a day with a few years ago telling me the whole story of ted uh you know when chris introduced rick i mean they're even cautiously trying you know they're so worried about oh my god we're gonna say this and i'm like this is one of the most incredible things you could do right now yeah to, to, to bring this to the world because i think there's gonna be a lot of breakthroughs you're going to see a lot of people abuse the system and try to exploit it and make money with it. And, you know, it's going to be a shit show. And there's also hopefully going to be a lot of healing that's going to come out of this, this, this new world. But when I, when I was talking to the, uh, the writer, I said, you know, um, almost twice as many people die every day from alcohol related deaths that do from opiates at the time. Now in the middle of this pandemic, that's completely, I mean, I don't even know the accurate stats. It's orders of magnitude more. Yeah. 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 And, you know, she, she's like, yeah, and, and they they want us to do, you know, more articles on opiates and because that's the shocking thing. And it's 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 just so weird. So going back to, you know, I, I went and um, and and did the Ibogaine and 5-MeO DMT. And then afterwards, I went back to, to Daniel Amen and uh, I did another interview with him looking over my brain. And we've I've got hours of footage <laughs> explaining, you know, kind of what happened before and after I did Ibogaine. And, you know, I'm not going to talk too much about it. I'll release that at a later point in time. But I also interviewed Dan Engel, who uh, is, you know, considered one of the top psychiatrists in the world that uses plant medicines and psychedelics for depression, PTSD, uh, addiction. And then Martin Polanco, who's an Ibogaine, um, you know, uh, provider, uh, was. I don't think that's his main focus anymore. Um, and Deanne Adamson, who runs a recovery coaching group called Being True to You. And so I, you know, I inter interviewed, uh, and then Daniel Amen, of course, showing my brain. And, and it's, I mean, you can, you can absolutely alter your brain in good ways or bad ways with yeah. sub substances. And, and people shouldn't think that everything is safe because it isn't. And uh, what, what isn't safe, though, is living a life that's destructive, that put yourself and others in danger that's constantly in angst. And so I'm a, I'm a big believer of what works, works. And I think one of the biggest causes of drug addiction uh, is the laws on drugs. It's, it, it's not the drugs that are the problem, it's the laws about the drugs. Because whenever you try to punitively approach this, you're going to look at these people as criminals. And uh, in, in the US, I don't know what it is this exact, but you know, just from like stats last year and stuff, 2.2 million people in prison, uh, 80 not to 90% of everyone that's arrested or thrown in jail, uh, alcohol and drugs were involved. 40% uh, of people, uh, a violent crime was, you know, uh, involved in that, but that means 60%, it wasn't a violent crime. And so much of these are just people that are addicts that are misbehaving, 
or they're doing things, but they're not necessarily evil people, right? They and just hurt. You, they're hurt. Yeah. 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 And there's that saying that hurt people hurt others. And I used to believe that fully, and that still is true, but there's a lot of hurt people that don't hurt others. There's a lot of hurt people that are compassionate. I mean, one thing for me, thank God, I've never been an abuser to the best of my knowledge. Does that mean I've not been a jerk or I don't have ex-girlfriends that think I was an asshole or something? Of course. I mean, I'm friends with almost every past you know, girlfriend that I've had, even though they all knew that I was had sexual addiction, which I'll explain what that is and what that means. Uh, I, I just, you know, have always, uh, even when I was a drug addict, even when I was just, you know, at the worst of being a troublemaker, I really, you know, from the best of my memory, and again, I'm, I'm, I say this, not trying to be in denial, because it's easy to rationalize stuff. And it's easy to forget, oh, I, you know, I, I do my, I've done my best with all my years of recovery to, to keep making amends whenever I feel I've wronged somebody or I've done something that I wish I did not do. Uh, I just really walked through the world uh, caring about people. Uh, it's just to go back to your point about beating ourselves up. I didn't care about myself. You know, I felt like such a piece of shit and I felt so useless and so worthless. So I would abuse myself and I would put drugs into my body and I would put myself in dangerous situations and I would, you know, just want to punish myself. And so, you know, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll wrap up a couple of things just to kind of take the, I have a really weird way of meandering around topics. Uh, you know, I didn't quite finish the childhood thing. So when I went, when I got into high school, I started smoking pot almost daily and it just opened me up. It allowed me to feel free and I could talk and I was nervous and I was so scared. I didn't know how to talk to, you know, women. I was afraid of everything. I didn't play sports. So I didn't have any phys. I was skinny. And uh, then I started getting high and all of a sudden I felt a freedom and I felt like this angst. And I understand why people will drink or inebriate themselves because for some people, it allows them to feel a freedom that they've never felt before. But the danger with that is, is if that becomes the only way you can feel there, then you don't develop the, the you don't undo the trauma that caused you to drink in the first place. Correct. You know, the, the, if you're, if you're depressed, if you're lonely, if you're anxiety ridden, if, if you can't feel happy or okay, unless you're getting higher, unless you're escaping. I mean, that, that's a tough way to live. And so if you're lonely, depressed, sad, there's nothing wrong, suicidal. There's nothing wrong with wanting those feelings to not be there, wanting those feelings to go away. The problem is how you scratch the itch. I mean, if you're, what we're really dealing with with addiction is a craving state. It's a craving, uh, you know, Guns N' Roses, the band, you know, one of their first very popular album was uh, Appetite for Destruction. Mm -hmm. And those three words very well describe addiction. It's an appetite for destruction. It's not an appetite for har harmony. It's not an appetite for serenity. It's not an appetite for nutrition. It's an appetite for junk food. It's an appetite for fucking causing like chaos, right? Yeah. And so the addict brain craves destruction. And when you keep doing it and it works, and if you're feeling lonely, but all of a sudden you feel better, it's a artificial form of, uh, of, of, of connection. So behind me, there's all these images from gaping void. Uh, it's kind of like a part of my culture wall. What you can't see from, you know, being on video here is like, it goes up much higher and even lower. But um, one of them says addiction is looking for love in all the wrong places. And uh, like a song. That, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, that's a song lyric. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, looking for love and all the, but you know, addiction is what I, uh, added to it. So uh, that's, you know, every time that I was uh, acting out, every time I was consuming drugs, looking back, even though there are times where it was fun and it was enjoyable, I was just looking for love. You know, I was looking for that feeling because you said it, it's the inability to feel okay. And we're trying to alter feelings because if, if you don't like the way you feel and you're drinking coffee or watching Netflix or scrolling on Instagram, or you're gambling or eating, you know, uh, Bill W, the founder of uh, AA, uh, he said, I uh, had a quote where as alcoholics, we're trying to drink God out of a bottle. Oh, and I'll, wow. and I'll share this with people. I'm like, look, even if you're an atheist, you know, uh, and I say that because I've spent many parts of my life trying to not believe in God. 
the whole notion of God being ridiculous. And, and, and even God, I don't even like the word because uh, it gets so, it's, it's used to manipulate. I mean, we have so much gaslighting being done to people under the name of God. And so call it source, call it energy, call it whatever you can connect with nature, or if you believe in God, whatever that God is. Uh, he said, as alcoholics, we're trying to drink God out of a bottle, that, that thing that you're trying to get to, right? And, uh, you know, you're either trying to drink the pain away, eat the pain away, gamble the pain away, work the pain away, fuck the pain away. You know, there's yeah. some there's some sort of pain there that you're 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 trying to, uh, you know, trying to to go away. And so uh, when I was um, when I was in high school, I was trying to to seek that out and it and it worked until it didn't, because I there's that line that you often hear, you know, cocaine addicts talk about, which is um the shortest line or the the, the, the sh shortest line is too much and the longest line is never enough it's just it can't be satiated it's like mm. a feeling that can never be fulfilled and drugs and partying and doing all this stuff would be great if it didn't have consequences and we have to look at the external forces like the alcohol slogan in the alcohol industry is drink responsibly it's very clever marketing. It's evil, but it's very clever marketing because what's the first word doing? It's commanding you to drink. Drink responsibly. The vast majority of alcohol is consumed. It's the 80-20 principle. Right. The vast majority of alcohol is consumed by a small person. They don't want these people to drink responsibly. Fuck, they want them to drink. They're their best clients. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Or what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Gr yeah. Great marketing slogan. You got to love that bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. It's like accept guilt and shame and debt and STDs. You know, man, that shit doesn't stay in Vegas. Nothing stays in Vegas. You do anything that's going to hurt someone else. You do something that's going to hurt yourself. There's this thing called karma. There's this thing called consequences that leaves residues. It leaves an imprint in your body, your brain, your soul. It knows what's happening. And so if you are in a position where you are doing that, my suggestion uh, is to find what is disconnecting you from the parts of you that really want to be your own best friend. Uh, and if, you know, if it's hard to have gratitude and love yourself, if you hate yourself, you know, when I, so here I was in high school and doing everything I could to escape stuff in my worst state, out of high school, I was free basing cocaine every day. Uh, at my worst uh, weight, I weighed 105 pounds um, because I'd gone about a week uh, without eating anything other than like chicken McNuggets and fast food, terrible food. You know, I, I haven't eaten fast food in, you know, years. Um, so at least fast food like Taco Bell or McDonald's or things like that. Okay. And so, uh, there's certainly foods that are fat. And I don't even know what it is right now due to the pandemic, but prior to the pandemic, the stats that I had read is that 10% of Americans eat their meals in their cars. It's probably 50 to 75% now with what we've been going through, right? Yeah. And so you imagine the, the- Uber Eats, like the stock of Uber Eats, like people are just ordering in and the comfort foods and well, you know, air quote comfort foods and yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, I, I had gotten to this place where I woke up to get high and I would get high throughout the day and I would uh, get high to go to bed. So it was uppers and downers all throughout the day. And uh, someone made a documentary on my life that's not released yet. It's called Connected, <laughs> the movie Connected, the Joe Pollard story. It was actually that Steve, very nice. Is that Steve's? Uh, it was, it, no, uh, uh, although Steve is a great guy. Hmm. Uh, no, it was um, uh, Devon Patel. He's oh. one of my Genius Network members. And I had made a movie for Dan Sullivan with a, uh, uh, David Berg and Nick Nanton, who has now won 16 Emmys. He's actually the one that made the movie. And I had shown uh, the Dan Sullivan film um, at my Genius Network annual event. And someone came up to Nick and said, you know, I want to make a movie on Joe. And my assistant, Eunice, who's been my assistant for 25 years, she's like my angel. And um, she said, you're not going to believe this, but someone wants to make a movie on you. And I'm like, well, that's not too hard to believe. I mean, but who is it? She's like, I can't tell you. He promised me that. And I'm like, and, and you're never going to guess who it is. And so I was like, is it so-and-so? She's like, no. And I, I can't tell you. And to her, you know, to her credit, she never told me. And 
So even though I tried to guess a million different people and I, you know, a few times I tried to get it out of her, but she, she wouldn't. And so a year later, we show this film of me at one of my annual events. And at the end of it, then I find out it was Devon Patel, who it was such a sweet thing. But the, the reason I bring that up is we, I'm telling some of the stories in, in high school in this movie. I'm talking about the, the, the drugs. And there's one day where I was uh, smoking uh, tobacco, smoking pot, drinking alcohol, snorting crystal, snorting Coke, and, and freebasing uh, cocaine, and on LSD all in the same day. I mean, yes. The shit that I would do to my body, the body, if you don't completely destroy it, which you could, uh, is quite resilient, especially when it's younger. And thank God, I mean, I am just, you know, I feel blessed and lucky with the shit that I put my myself through. Um, and I didn't want to. There's, you know, these people are like, well, you know, they wouldn't be that way if they if they didn't want to. There, there's not a single addict that is injecting you know, a, a syringe into their body that is smoking, doing drugs or whatever, because they're in pain that wants to be there. You know, there, there's not, I mean, I even have, you know, enormous empathy for people that have done pretty awful shit because I have to, like one of the premises with, and when I say I have to, meaning for my own sanity and my own ability to help people, you have to come from a compassionate approach. I've, you know, 95% of the people that I work with have been raped, molested, uh, abused. And when I say work with, I don't charge for this. I'm not, I'm not a therapist. I'm not a counselor. And when someone needs, you know, I, I will be a listening ear. I will be a companion and I will operate with people to just talk with them. And if I can provide education, I will. And then if someone needs, uh, you know, different level of stuff, I mean, I've, I've recommendations, but I am, you know, call this person, read this, talk to this, look at this. It's that sort of stuff. I'm not a therapist. So, and I don't charge for it. So, it, you know, it's, it's part of the and a lot of this I take from 12 steps. And let me say something about 12 steps too, because a lot of times people that have not had a good experience with 12 steps have an immediate negative reaction to it, right? In the same way that if someone had some scummy marketer take advantage of them, they think all marketers are bad, right? And, and, and many of them have earned that reputation and, and they are bad. <laughs> so in terms of how they do stuff. And so like the latest research on 12 steps and people can look it up online, uh, for years they were getting bashed that there's not, you know, the relapse rate is high, 3% success rate, all this stuff that you couldn't even properly quantify anyway, because we're dealing with anonymous programs. And the latest research has come out is actually how effective 12 steps really are. And what I like about 12 steps is that uh, it, and I'll talk about what I like and what I dislike. Uh, first off, it was created in the 1930s. And so we're talking back then there was no cure for addiction. There was no solution. And I would argue about a cure because it's like, you know, the only way you're going to cure addiction is you have to deal with the underlying trauma. And I don't think addiction goes away because it's kind of like saying it's a solution. You know, you don't cure breathing. You're going to continue to breathe. You'll do it better. So if you, it's, it's not like something that, oh, I used to be an addict and I'm no longer an addict. It, it's a way of coping with pain. And if you don't view it that way, you're going to you know, you're not in, in some people, what well, they that's say, more all, that's very all or nothing. Right. And I always say like, when it's all or nothing, we often choose nothing. <laughs> you know, it's like, if I can't do it this way, then I'm not going to do it at all. Like you can't, it's, it's not always black and white like that. Exactly. And in this particular case, it is not black and white at all. There's, there's levels of, of gray and there's all kinds of shades to this. And there's also depths of trauma. So different people have much deeper need and, and deeper pain even if it wasn't severe, because a lot of people are like, well, I was never raped. I was never molested. I was never beaten. I was never you know, locked up in a closet. You might have witnessed something that just really impacted you. You may have had a loss. You know, you, you may have a level of sensitivity. A lot of this is biochemical. So with 12 steps, uh, you know, someone joined a gym and they didn't go to the gym. They couldn't say gyms don't work. You know, it's like, well, gyms don't work. I joined a gym. When did you, I haven't gone and these freaking gyms don't work, but people will go to a meeting. They'll not do the steps and they'll say 12 steps don't work. I went to 12 steps. I'm still an addict. I, I still have these. It's, it's, it's not an attendance methodology. It's a step methodology. If you go to a 12 step group and do the steps and get a sponsor, then the likelihood of you gaining recovery and doing inventories and, and admitting powerlessness and understanding that your life is unmanageable and that you have to connect with other people 
because that's what it is. It's about fellowship for men and women. And it started with Alcoholics Anonymous. And Bill W., who was the founder of AA, was a sex addict. Bill W. did LSD. Bill W. is known, you know, one of, uh, I don't know what percentage of the royalties of the big book, which he copyrighted. He's one of the few people, uh, you know, a lot of the royalties were left to his mistress, right? So this was not a perfect human. And he, you know, I don't think he ever admitted to being a perfect human, but he created something prior to the creation of 12 steps that um, there was no solution to that. It started out from the Oxford group in the 1800s and then became, um, you know, 12 steps. He added, you know, there's like four steps and then he, you know, I'm not going to go into the whole history and there are people that are a thousand times more knowledgeable on, you know, the, you know, the, the history of, 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 uh, Alcoholics Anonymous than, than I am. What I will say, though, is it is readily available, and there are millions of people whose sobriety and whose, uh, which is not recovery. Getting sober is not the same thing as being, you know, a, a healthy whole person. There's a lot of dry drunks running around the world where they stop drinking, but they haven't dealt with the underlying issues that cause them to drink in the first oh, place. Oh, that's good. Just, a lot of dry drunks. That's great. Yeah, they're just take, they've just yeah. taken it... Uh, They've just taken it into other areas, right? right. So if you don't right. deal with the underlying stuff that's causing you to do this stuff. It's just going to show up in another area of life. And so, um, you know, so with with 12 steps, it gives a community. And I've never seen a addict. Um, there's a true addict recover in isolation. So silent battles are the hardest battles to fight. And with the pandemic now, there's a lot of people that used to go to in-person meetings and they can no longer do that. And there's a lot, especially people that have internet addictions, which could be full, full, you know, technology and digital addictions, which is huge. And most people won't admit it. So many people that are listening right now that cannot go to bed without scrolling through their phone easily. I'm one of those people. It's like a magnet. I have to like literally set up ways because it's a it's a dopamine cash register yes. whenever you're looking and, and what happens to and you me, pull the, the pull down to see if you want it's almost like a slot machine right you pull it down to see if you're going to get a new like you know it, there's a book called addiction by design about gambling in vegas that if you read that book and look at how it applies to technology and social media today it totally makes sense it's all addiction by design even bj fogg who's one of my genius network members is a stanford professor who created the behavior design lab in Stanford, he's brilliant. His book, Tiny Habits, uh, this year has been chosen as the number one business book on Amazon, even though he never wrote it as a business book and it exp explains all behavior. Now he admits, we have a lot of good discussions on addiction because he's not an addiction expert. And we've, we've, we have a lot of uh, ways that we've looked at each other's uh, you know, knowledge and understanding and how it applies. I even went and spoke uh, to his class at Stanford last year and I was thought I was gonna talk about entrepreneurship but I ended up talking about addiction and I, I took a film crew and we recorded that will eventually put that footage out. But it's like what I found interesting is he had all of these brilliant students. I mean, here's my education. I went to New Mexico State after I got out of high school and I'll come back to BJ. I, I uh, went to New Mexico State um, to escape doing drugs. I went and lived in a trailer uh, for two years with my father in a, in a mobile home park to get sober. I had ravaged my body so badly. And um, so I went to New Mexico State, you know, but I didn't get a degree in anything. And while I was there, um, I got a job, uh, first off, delivering newspapers in a piece of crap Chevy pickup truck that I owned. And, um, and then, a, uh, and then I, I got a job selling gym memberships in a health club. And that's when I first started working out for the first time. And from there, uh, I ended up meeting, uh, well, here's a great thing, getting in physical health and working out and exercise, in some cases, it could be better than a therapist or better than anything because the issues are in the tissues. You know, you've probably heard that before. The issues are in the tissues and, and you have to get into the body. And so that was so valuable to me. And then I met someone uh, at the, at the, after I'd worked in this gym for probably a year and I was, I, that's where I learned how to sell is selling gym memberships. And this guy offered me a job in a mental hospital. So I went and worked at a mental hospital as a mental health tech. And so I used to uh, have do charts in the uh, adult ward, the adolescent ward. Honestly, I, I thought the people running in the hospital were crazier than most of the patients that were there. There were some really incredible people that were in there that were just in pain. They're in pain. And I used to drive the addicts 
one of the things they had me do was drive the addicts during night shift to the AA meetings, the NA meetings, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, and Cocaine Anonymous meetings. And I would sit in on those meetings being, you know, never having gone to rehab. Like I went to New Mexico and I got sober cold turkey because I cut myself off from all of the relationships. I couldn't get access to the drug. And so the environment, you know, is, is important and not being around other people doing drugs. And so I got sober, but sitting in on those meetings, I never realized how instrumental later in life that would become. So when I came back to Arizona, I actually came back sober and with a whole newfound knowledge that was, I never thought I would have. So then I went to New Mexico, I mean, um, Chandler Gilbert Community College is where I went and got more of my college education. And I got a, I failed owning and operating a small business. And then I um, got a C minus in principles of marketing. <laughs> and I, you know, that's that, really uh, fun. I mean, that's so serendipitous and also hilarious. At the same yeah, oh, I even I have a book that's not even out yet. So no <laughs> one can even buy this book, but it's it's called The Average Joe's Marketing Book. Mm -hmm. And I have, let me see if I can find it. Uh, yeah, I got it right here. I actually have a picture of my report card, which oh, actually God. shows that, God. that that I failed at owning and operating a small business. And I got, yeah, I got a, a C minus in, uh, uh, oh, I got a B though in interpersonal communication. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Yeah, but that's literally a, a copy of my report card. Uh, and so um, so anyway, when I was asked to speak at Stanford, you know, that's a big deal to me because it's like, I, you know, and so BJ Fogg can uh, explain uh, all behavior through his model, which is, uh, oh, let me mention this about BJ. So it, people that don't know understand the significance of this. One of his students took what they learned <laughs> through BJ and other things at Stanford and they created Instagram. They're the co-founder of Instagram. Oh. So, so basically, and you know, know people, yeah, a lot of people have utilized uh, BJ's work, you know, near IL who I've had speak at, you know, he wrote the book hooked. He's been to BJ's stuff. Uh, uh, James clear from atomic habits, you know, is, is learned from BJ. So there's, a, there's a lot of, you know, people putting out very good and very interesting work that, have learned from BJ and, and he's, he's a professor, great guy, super nice guy, brilliant. And he explains all behaviors, uh, maps, mo uh, behavior, a B equals MAP, motivation, ability, and prompts. And you can explain good behavior and bad behavior all through maps, motivation. So a lot of self-help, you have people like get motivated. Get, actually, it doesn't take any motivation to look at your phone and look at porn. It, 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 you don't need to be motivated. I mean, it's highly stimulating. It's built in. You don't need motivation to look at Instagram. You're looking at constant little dopamine hits. So they build in all the prompts. So the way that we're controlled by technology and algorithm is they build in the prompts. What are you interested in? Sign up for it. Download this app. Look at this, whatever. And you just start and they, they make it easy. That gives you the ability. And they just build in the prompts. Every time you get a text, Every time you get notified, every time an alarm rings, you know, how did I show up today to do a podcast with you? We had it scheduled, right. you know, it's a prompt, right? right? And, and, and if you, someone subscribes to your podcast and they're downloading it, well, you know, they don't, you've made it easy for them. They don't have to remember to go get Dr. Stephanie's podcast. It's just getting delivered to them. Right. Right. So we, we use these things in good or bad ways. So for someone with addiction, it's, it's way beyond control though. And that's why the more that you can set up the right sort of problem. So if you look at 12 step meetings, you know, people that are successful with things, winners find ways to win, losers find ways to lose. When, in areas of my life where I'm losing, I've not yet put a success recipe in place. Areas of my life where I'm winning, I've put a winning recipe in place. We're winning and losing all day long. I'm going to get off this podcast with you and there's going to be some things that I will do today that I will create a result. And there's gonna be other things where I'm gonna screw up, I'm gonna waste my time. And the more that I can understand human behavior. And so BJ you know, has, has been very helpful. And, 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 and I'll tell you, most of the people that are out there telling people take massive action and, and stuff like that. It's actually the wrong advice. You, people don't take massive action. If it's so daunting, you may try it when you're highly motivated, but if the motivation wanes, then you feel like a loser. But it always does wane. <laughs> and that's the Absolutely. Secret. It's not constant. It's not a, it's not a Delta. Yeah. It's, it's actually, the, it's not the thing to rely on. The thing yeah. to rely on is ability and prompts. 
tied in with it. So we're going to need all of those things in different levels. But so, you know, there's this is and, and now this is an opinion. This is all science based research. And that's what I love about it, because there's a lot of people pontificating, you know, what they think is the way to get through life. And then there's like this is actually what works and why. And, 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 and here's the research we've been doing for years to actually yeah. validate it and prove that. So anyway, so the uh, the thing with 12 steps, let me just say this, uh, Stephanie, and then I'll shut up for a minute. And, and, and I know you'll say very smart things here. So I'm just, again, I'm just going off on my little tangents. By the way, ADD, I learned from Gabor Mate, is also what he believes is a response from trauma. I believe it too. It yeah. is a def absolutely a trauma response. Yeah, so you're witnessing yes. this freak show called Joe Polish here. I still have a lot of this, you know, going off of my team. You always come back to it though. I'll say like, you are a great storyteller because you always come back. Like we came back to the BJ. You were like, I'm just going to put it up. To this. You came back to it. So, you know, you're, you're, good. Doing, well, you're doing real good. No, thank, thank you. And I'm, I'm also worried that there's probably going to be, uh, Dan Sullivan calls me a multiplier and he says a multiplier, there's simplifiers and multipliers. And he said, multipliers will talk about 30 things in 30 minutes and they won't close the loop on any. <laughs> he says, but they're great when you need to get fuel behind something. And he's right. like, and the multipliers are the ones that, that grow things. And so I'm trying to use my multiplier abilities to get ideas out into the world, to get yeah. solutions out into the world. So even Ned Hollowell, who's the top ADD, ADHD psychiatrist in the world, and even Daniel Amen, who's done a lot of stuff, all of them, Gabor, Daniel, uh, you know, Ned, they're all friends of mine. And they all have different opinions on how they look at stuff. So I, I sort of take in information and I treat it like 12 step groups, take what you like and leave the rest. And that's what I would say to anyone listening to anything I say, I'm certainly, there will be things I'll say that may not land for some people and others that do. But the way that I even work with addicts is like uh, within 12 steps, the only requirement for membership is a willingness to get better. And if I say, oh, someone doesn't deserve treatment, someone doesn't deserve to be listened to, someone that is showing up and saying, I'm trying to do something here, even if the world thinks I'm a scoundrel. Because look, I've had those. I mean, I, I, I was asked to be Harvey Weinstein's sober coach. You know, and the only reason I even say that is because someone took a video of me having dinner with Harvey Weinstein. And I spent the whole dinner going over one of my books on addiction recovery with him. And then someone, you know, had to shoot a video of that so they could sell it to TMZ. So I did an interview with TMZ about it. And Everyone out of the woodworks is like, you know, why are you having dinner with Harvey Weinstein? It's like, for one, it's not like I wanted to hang out with Harvey Weinstein. It's like I get asked to meet with all kinds of people all the time. And when he was in, you know, in town trying to get treatment, uh, I was one of the people that was asked because I so openly talk about addiction. So I, you know, I meet a lot of famous people and most of them have been raped. Most of them have been abused. Most of them have had a lot of shit. Every once in a while, you'll get people that have been accused of stuff, and things like that. And it comes with the territory. And, and the only way to change the global conversation about any of this stuff is to have the conversations and to right. understand what's going on. Yes, it's, it's very, it's very difficult. And it's, it's, it's really hard when, you know, when I sit and look at, and I look at everyone, like if, if people understood the atmospheric conditions of his life, uh, it, some of it makes sense. It doesn't excuse wrongdoing. It doesn't excuse bad behavior. It just helps you understand how to, so, because all the media was trying to contact me saying, you know, will you do a story? I'm like, if you want to do a scandalous story on Harvey, no. If you want to talk about addiction recovery, I'll do that. None of them wanted to do that. They all just want to have, you know, they all want to turn it into. Well, know, it's all clickbait, right? Like they don't actually want to talk about the real issue, which is, you know, like you were saying, the atmospheric conditions that led to his behavior. And we know the behavior is always downstream. It's always like the manifestation of it, the taking of the drugs, the being on the Instagram, the, all that's downstream from the trauma that we've been talking about. So this is why I think that you're doing a wonderful job in, in, I think a better question that we can be asking is how can we actually help these people? Right? So how can we, how can we not, you know, incarcerate them or put them on, you know, what I would call chemical castration, which is, you know, whatever the pharmaceutical that they're going to, that they're going to receive, how can we actually get them to do the real work, which is much scarier and much harder. It's much harder to look at your own shadows and to look at your own shit than it is to always, you know, point the finger elsewhere or, you know, like tick the box. Like I hired the best guy I hired the, you know, so I'm going to outsource it to someone else. It's always harder to do that work, but it's much more, you know, when we're playing the long game, like the short game is like, you know, you know, the short game is for chumps, right? We want to be, we want to be talking about the long game. That's what's going to afford you the results and the life and the inner peace that you are seeking with this destructive behavior in the short term. It, I totally agree. I totally agree. And, and, 
and you know the it, it is it is so much easier for people to you know going back to my thing uh, um i want to change the global conversation about how people view and treat addicts with compassion instead of judgment and find the best forms of treatment that have effic efficacy and share it with the world and the only reason like the first one treating them with uh, compassion is for one if you don't understand what happens to somebody and what caused them to be that way then you're never get, we're never going to get to a solution and you cannot punish pain out of people again and or you're if, choosing not to you're choosing not to because every single person has had some form of trauma whether it is this egregious very obvious form of trauma like you have endured or it's other smaller you know where a child didn't necessarily have the frontal lobe or the verbal capacity to ask for help or the you know the or they felt scared or you know maybe even if nothing else happened the day that your father gave your dog away you know that would be traumatic for most kids that age like that's your best friend you know it's your furry you know it's your fur baby or whatever you know yeah. and and you pile that on top of all the other things of course that's you know that's the Joe Polish story, but for so, for so many, just that, just that piece uh, would be traumatic for someone and have abandonment issues and fear of, um, you know, fear of death, you know, and all, all the different things that can come from it. Exactly. And, and that, and that's, you know, that's what I want, you know, to, to, to constantly learn about myself is what is, instead of treating the fruit, let's treat the root, you know, because so much of what we do, and if you, and you know this, I mean, you go to mo most, doctors, and I have a lot of clients that are, I mean, integrated doctors, medical doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists, um, naturopaths, a uh, bunch of people in the health field. And we live in a world where, you know, most of it is a pill for an ill. If it's not a medicine, it's a, it's a supplement. And, and, right. and some of those are helpful and some of those are needed. And some of those save lives. And a lot of it is just the way we've learned how to monetize addiction and the way we've learned how to monetize, you know, humans and try to, you know, sell them a ticket to the good ship hope versus you know giving them real hope because hope heals if provided in the right way if provided in the wrong way hope could be a, a, a very empty uh, promise and and it you know and, and I have a lot of views good and bad about you know the proper uh, usage of the tool of hope <laughs> I guess I would say there's something that came to mind though which I think I should mention this um, you know since since I've been talking about sex addiction since I mentioned someone like Harvey who clearly you know, is uh, one of the most hated people, uh, you know, in the world, especially during that, that period of time. Um, you know, this whole thing on sex addiction. The sex addiction is a very interesting thing. Even in 12 Steps, uh, Bill W. wrote about how everyone has sex problems. And if you, if you actually think about sex in a, in a very pure form, it's, it's, it, it's an incredible deep connection of, 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 of intimacy and privacy and, 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 and bonding. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, and, by the way, no one would be uh, no one would be alive if we weren't doing this thing called having sex. You know, there's people out there having sex. That's why we're all here. Someone, someone had sex. Someone right now is having sex. <laughs> exactly, and someone later today will have sex. And there's a lot of people <laughs> that are single and lonely right now. You know, it, like including myself at this moment. I don't know if I'm lonely at this moment, but definitely I'm single at the moment. And in the middle of a pandemic, and that's very isolating, and that's right. very difficult, and that's very challenging. And the porn industry is exploding right now, right? And uh, it's it's crazy. So, what the heck is the difference between uh, sex and intimacy? What's the difference between love and intimacy? And you know, and and, and, and the, the, the 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 punchline here is I don't know. I have different ideas about it. But what I, one of the best definitions I ever heard of intimacy was uh, given to me by a seventy-year-old gay man who I never met in person. Talked to him on the phone because I had a friend that I had. 12 step, meaning he came to his first 12 step meeting in 2003, it was. And I, you know, kind of introduced him to the program. And he introduced me to this guy many, many years later. And he um, uh, said to me, he said, uh, this 70 year old man devotes his life to sponsoring people with sexual addictions. The word sex addiction unfortunately comes with a tremendous amount of judgment. Many people think, oh, pervert you know, exhibitionist, you know, uh, someone that needs to sleep with a lot of women, porn addict, and it could be all of those things, right? Uh, it could also be deprivation. It could be, there's a lot of similarities between sexual addiction and eating. I mean, even 10 years ago, I did an interview with uh, Pat Carnes, who's, you know, considered the 
you know, top sex addiction doctor in the world. He, he wrote the very first book on sex addiction called Out of the Shadows and many books since then. Uh, people can watch my interview with him online if they type in my name and sex addiction, they can find that. But basically, um, you know, every person has an arousal template. So when you're first introduced to sexuality, uh, whatever is, you know, arousing or turns you on. And if it feels good, you're going to desire that in the same way that if you ate chocolate for the first time and you're like, your taste buds like chocolate, you're going to crave chocolate. You now have a cellular memory of this is pleasurable. This tastes good. Touch feels good. If, if, if it's, if it's done though, in a very harmful way, like, you know, people would say to me, you know, how, how can you, how, how can you meet with someone that's actually, you know, done bad sexual things to someone it's like well the people that are probably the most qualified to maybe have some understanding about it are people that had it done to them okay and that have had to, had to deal with it and because how the hell does someone know what something is like if they've not been through it now that being said you don't i don't need to get shot by a gun in order to have a sense that getting shot by a gun is probably not a good idea but there are certain things that if you don't experience it you don't really no, you just kind of have an observational understanding or you watched a, a TV show or some shit and you think you're an expert, which is not, not the same thing. So when it comes to um, arousal templates, uh, whatever we're introduced to that feels good, we will crave it. But if you're introduced to sex in a very toxic, shameful, negative way, you may act out your sex life in a very dangerous way. So a lot of women that I've, I've talked with over the years and met with um, that have been in abusive relationships, physically, sexually, mentally. If you trace back to their childhood, many of them were raped, many of them were assaulted, many of them were abused. And, and as you know, huge numbers of, of children, men and women have been sexually violated. Okay, they have, lines have been crossed, some to just inappropriate, you know, talk to, um, you know, touching to, you know, rape and, and, and horrible things. And what happens is they have a lot of dents and, we go out in life and we find people whose dents match our dents. And if you don't go to the, metaphorically speaking, the body shop and, and work those dents out, you're going to keep getting into car crashes. And so, and, and I did that for most of my, you know, twenties and thirties, uh, even though I had some great relationships, I had some not so great relationships and I would find myself constantly acting out uh, sexually um, and, and it, it, it was very difficult. And what I mean by acting out, everyone in, in, in sex addiction, if you go to, uh, you know, like Sex Addicts Anonymous, Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, Sexaholics Anonymous, uh, sex, Sexual Compulsivity Anonymous, there's different sex addiction groups. And then there's many therapists and other groups that actually deal with sexual addiction. But what sexual addiction really is, is it's an intimacy disorder. Uh, it, and so going back to Wharton, he said, this 70 year old gay man, he said, my favorite definition of intimacy. and, and I've had some people say, oh, I would say it this way, but this is exactly the way he said it to me. So I always like, uh, you know, I always like citing the source of anything that I hear. I'm a, I'm a big believer in if you hear an idea from someone, credit them, even if they're dead and no one knows them, it's the right thing to do. I, I very much respect people's uh, IP, their intellectual property. So uh, he said, uh, intimacy is a mutual exploration of a shared safe place. Uh, a, a mutual ex exploration of a shared safe place. Mm -hmm. Addictions are anything, or abuse, I'm sorry, uh, abuse is anything that takes away the safe place, and addictions are what we do to make ourselves feel good when we don't have a safe place. So I'll say it again. Um, intimacy is a mutual exploration of a shared safe place. Abuse is anything that takes away the safe place, and addictions are what we do to make ourselves feel good when we don't have a safe place. And when I heard that, I realized, holy shit, my whole life, I never felt safe in the world. And I would try to find now if you're introduced to something sexually that's dangerous, or scary or hum humiliating, uh, embarrassing, you know, d that leaves you feeling like a piece of meat that leaves you feeling abused. The weird thing about it for some people is they all of a sudden had this toxicity was planted in them met mentally or physically and they seek it out to relive that experience. So women that have been viciously abused will sometimes partner with abusive boyfriends and vice versa. Men that were abused will find ways to replicate the abuse. And I found myself in my life 
going and actually helping people that were narcissists. Even in my business life, it wasn't until recently, like, why the fuck do I help that person? Because something in my unconscious is like, oh, I need to reinforce this per and, and, and it's it's hard to have fear without excitement, like on a roller coaster. It's exciting, but it's fearful, or watching a horror movie. It's exciting. Same thing with sexuality. If you're raped and you feel sexually stimulated, it's fearful, it's horrible. And also your body feels this thing. And no one talks about this stuff, hardly at all. And it, and it dictates so many people's lives. And so the most watched porn is super aggressive. In many cases, it's replicating violence. And the only thing, unless they've done latest research on this, because there's always new research they're finding, the, the, the only thing that makes the brain light up quicker than sexual imagery is crystal meth. And when a woman or a man watches an image, sexual imagery, it's highly stimulating. And I think all social media is based on porn. It first starts with attractive humans, but if there was no pictures of men and women that looked attractive or look at how I look in everything from skin, you know, like outfits to makeup, to hair, to whatever, uh, it'd be food porn, you know, look at the meal. It'd be right. vacation porn or it'd be animal porn. Look at the dog. Look at my cat. Look at my, it'd be car porn. Look at my Lamborghini. Look at all that. So it's like, like we live in this world of like, but what it's doing is the biochemical aspects of what it's doing to the brain. It's creating, and what happens is the more you get stimulation, but the desire for stimulation is not satiation, but it's to try to make pain go away then you keep wanting more. And what happens is that's where you build up a tolerance. That's where ODs happen. What is an overdose? An overdose is I just need so much of this to take these feelings away, to make me feel this pleasure, whatever it is, pleasure, pain, motivated. Uh, most of the time, even when you think you're going out to drink to feel good, you're actually, you know, you feel shitty and it's just making you feel a little bit better. And you just don't realize how shitty you actually feel because your baseline is you don't even know what true connection feels like. Right. You don't know what responding to life feels like and so what happens is you know we have this whole planet of people trying to inebriate themselves numb themselves through netflix through social media through drugs through gambling through gaming through food through codependency through controlling relationships and we actually think we're in control of this shit we're not in control of any of it if it's controlling us and so uh, that, that's, that's the stuff that, you know, when it comes to where do you not feel safe in the world? And so when I heard that, I was like, damn, when I would go out and pay for sex, my arousal template was when I was being molested as a kid, I was paid money not to say anything. And it embedded into my mind that sex is shameful and dirty unless you pay for it. And I never had a model of a healthy relationship. My mother died when I was four. My father never remarried. All I saw was the pain and struggle that my father went through. Like as a kid growing up with that and hearing that every day, like it doesn't make you say, oh, let me go out and meet a wonderful loving woman. Like the, sub, the subconscious, the unconscious is like, you're gonna be abandoned. Relationships equal pain. When all your caretakers abuse you, when, you know, I used to go to a summer camp that my father would send me to, and the camp counselors would make us do sexual shit to each other, to the, to the, uh, to the boys. Sorry, that's a little ring doorbell thing going off in the background. Mm. So, um, you know, that's a prompt to, 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 to just throw me off. There. That's a little prompt that makes you look at things. That's that's the insidiousness of technology. It's it's incredible yeah. for so many ways. But so you know, there was there was all of this. Uh, I sort of threw myself off. I was talking about the camp counselors, but you know they. Yeah. All, all of this sort of stuff. So I just never felt, uh, I didn't understand intimacy. I didn't understand what relationships were. And that's the problem is we have to figure this shit out yeah. unless we happen to seek it out and we find someone and we find someone that can help us put us on the right path. And, and so my whole thing is that, man, when I, I was just looking for connection. And so I, later in life, you know, when I started making money, I would hire escorts. I would pay for sex and I would feel like a piece of shit. And I'd be like, what the hell's wrong with me? And how could I ever say this to someone and talk about this? And like, you know, I, I don't get it. And I suffered from sexual anorexia where I, you know, if I cared about someone so deeply, it was hard for me to be sexual with them because 
being sexual with someone that you care about is a dirty thing. How are you going to do that with someone that you love? And so what I, what I learned is that it was hard for me to be sexual with people that mattered. And it's not that the, the people that I was sexual with didn't matter. I actually was a very caring person. Uh, always have been. I mean, there's something about me, which is one part I never had respect for, but I respect for it now is I actually deeply empathetic person. I very much care to the point though, I take on other people's pain. And that's where some of the, you know, the caretaking and an unhealthy uh, sort of uh, trying to be of service, you know, I've sacrificed myself many times. And so it's one, again, one of the reasons I'm going to go on a sabbatical next year is I really want to, whatever I can offer to the world, I want to make sure I do it to the right people in the right ways and the right doses. So it's not depleting me, it's, it's nurturing me. And, you know, and, and there's a lot of people right now that are in really toxic relationships, really bad relationships, and they're not even aware why. And it's because they, they were just hurt and they're trying to work out their hurt there. And so, you know, there's, there are solutions and I'll talk about those solutions too. Um, but I just wanted to say that and see if you have any, any questions or comments or so I no, I mean, I, I just want to applaud you because you're so open and honest and transparent about it. And I just think that this is how we change. This is how we change the way we relate to it. You know, you can understand, you know, to use your uh, vernacular, you can understand the atmospheric pressure that you had when you had someone that you cared about, but you didn't have the template. You didn't know that, you know, you could be intimate and you didn't have to pay for it. And it didn't have to feel like you were a piece of shit or a piece of meat like that. It makes perfect sense. Right. But if you choose not to, it will be very easy for people who are not comfortable with the vast palette that the human experience entails. It'll be very easy for someone to be like, you're so, you know, you're so, you're such a bad person for doing that for such a, you know, you're such a bad person for going out and paying for sex, but you can understand what you learned as a child and why that drove, you know, what your belief systems were around intimacy and why that drove the behavior that you did. And that's why I said before, your behaviors are always downstream from your BS, right? from your belief systems, right? So your belief systems always are the thing that drives all your behavior. So if you can unpack that and understand, you know, the atmospheric pressure uh, that someone had growing up when these, when these belief systems were developing about themselves, about how they interact with the world, how the world sees them, you know, what their worth is, then you can begin to understand how, um, you know, someone who is self-sabotaging, who doesn't love themselves, who've been told in some or many ways that they're not worthy, um, how they may engage in this destructive type of behavior. Yes, yes, very much so. And I was told as a kid, new, I mean, a, a thousand times, you're worthless, you're never going to mount anything, you know, I wish you never existed. I mean, I've heard all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And, and those things came from people just, just didn't know what else to say. They were just hurt and they were resentful. And it's, it's challenging because I, you know, on one hand, if you have toxic people in your life and they're not, and you're not able to, uh, they're, Dr. Romani Devasala, the narcissist expert really helped me a lot with this. Um, I have an interview with her. I haven't released it yet, but it's, we're going to, and uh, she, we talked about um, forgiveness. There's a lot of fetishizing forgiveness. And if you still have resentment towards someone and they're still hurting you and they're still doing things, you can forgive someone. But it's if someone's still throwing rocks through your window every day, for real or metaphorically speaking, just in the way they behave, or you have to share, you know, custody with a partner that you resent. And again, there's two sides to everything. I would I would challenge people before you start making the other person to be an asshole, clean up your own side of the street first, yeah. because you'll sometimes realize that you're pissed and you're angry and you think someone they don't have the same political belief as you, or they, you know, they don't think the way they don't see the world. And so therefore they're, Oh, bad. you see that all the time now, right? You see like with the mask wearing and the, you know, the vaccine, all that conversation that's happened. Like you see people that are completely polarized and not able to listen to each other. And I often like joke privately, I'm sort of this like really crazy radical center, like central person now who's like, oh, I'll look at the right and I can see these points. I'll look at the left. And I can see these points. And I'm sort of somewhere in the middle because I take a little bit of everything. Um, but people really want you to choose a side too. Like I, I've had some, you know, I've had some heat for interviewing whoever on the podcast and just people like, Meh, how could you interview this person? She's this, he's that, you know, whatever. So. Oh yeah. You know, like we all get, it. I mean, hell, even me mentioning Harvey Weinstein, people are like, you what? know, yeah. well, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah uh, 
you try to do the work. And, and plus, I don't get paid for this shit. So you, right. you, try, you try to sit down with right. someone who's pretty, you know, can be a pretty obnoxious, you know, mm. sort of situation. Um, however, um, I put myself in difficult sort of conversations because I want to learn. And there, there are certain people that I dislike uh, and I don't like the way they view things. And if they're willing to talk about things and be open and honest, I will still interview them. You know, I will still, if someone's genuinely trying to seek help or I'm asked to do something from someone that, you know, and I think it's going to benefit others and I think I can learn something to be more beneficial. Yeah. And there's other people I'll just flat out avoid it because, you know, some games in life, the only way you win is you don't play. And there are certain decisions that I've made where it's like, oh my God, you know, why did I get into that one? Because that's just a whirlpool that, you know, there's, it's, it's you know, no matter what you do, someone's going to, you know, come out. I mean, hell, even talking about sex addiction, sleeping, paying for sex, you know, people will you know, uh, op open myself to attack and have judgment. But most of that uh, comes because they're not willing to look into themselves. And the reason I, here's, here's the thing, though. in 2000 and, um, 2005, I started uh, something called Artists for Addicts. And we're at the whole point, we, we made a documentary, which actually has not been released also. I have another movie, uh, but it won, it won the- uh, We have uh, a lot of updating on our show notes. So I'll just say when all these things come out, we got to go back and update all the things in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I guess we do. I guess we do, yeah. So- uh, you know, yeah, it, it, it's a great movie. It's called Black Star, and uh, it was done with John Butcher was the author, uh, the artist, and uh, Kara Chan, who's just a dear friend and a brilliant, uh, you know, uh, director and editor and, uh, you know, filmmaker. And so we did this, uh, this, this film, um, Artists for Addicts, and we played it as a short film. It's 34 minutes right now, but we're, the reason we haven't released it is we want to actually expand it because I want to use uh, art as a force for good. There's so many artists uh, that are musicians and actors and actresses and writers and sculptors and painters that uh, have lived such incredible pain and they express themselves through art. You know, if people walked through the Hollywood Walk of Fame, if they understood how many of those Hollywood stars of the filmmakers and the actors and the writers and people that are being, that have a Hollywood star how many of those people died from addiction? How many of those people lived with addiction? It's the, 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 the people that we watch, the people that we admire, you know, some of the films that you found so inspiring, you know, were made by people that were massive addicts, you know, and, 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 and people don't, know. so we made this movie Black Star to honor, you know, many of the people that we have lost. It was named after David Bowie's last album, Black Star, and he's the, the in the middle of the painting is David Bowie and 80, 81 other famous people that have died um, that were addicts. And some uh, recovered, like David Bowie. I think when he was 27, him and Iggy Pop went to, uh, uh, you know, London, I believe, uh, UK, and they uh, lived off, you know, milk and cocaine for a long period of time. And then Bowie got sober and ended up making another 40 years worth of some of the most incredible, you know, works of, you know, art and music and movies and stuff in the world. But uh, so we made this, uh, this, this film. Uh, and when we played it at my annual event, I got up on stage beforehand and just said shit that I'd never said before. I mean, I, I talked about a little bit, I would allude to drugs and I've always been working in addiction recovery stuff and I would talk about it, but I never made it when I'm, but there was a part of me, it's like going, you know, if I had all the money in the world, I would put it towards, um, you know, addiction recovery because wars, disease, so much of this is caused by addiction. I would even argue that the pandemic, much of what you're seeing is uh, the chemistry going on culturally. Uh, in, if people want to understand, I'm not going to go into it because it could take a longer period of time than I want to take right now to explain it, but there's a book called War is a Force that Gives Us Meaning. Pandemic is a force that gives us meaning. Disease, death, political freaking, uh, you know, disparity, political arguing. It's, you know, people are addicted and hijacked by clickbait and all of this stuff. Yeah. Really good for companies, you know, the vice industries love a lot of cultural shit. Whenever there's wars, whenever there's recessions, gambling goes up, alcohol consumption goes up, caffeine consumption goes up, vice pornography goes up. I mean, there's even Nazi Germany in, um, you know, 1930s, uh, they created, um, they invented crystal meth 
and uh, Hitler was being injected with perpetine, I think is how they pronounced it, uh, almost daily uh, during you know, a long period of time and the, the, uh, most of the German army was being given it and they would fight longer, eat less, sleep less, be more aggressive. And when I was meeting with Pat Carnes, he had gotten a Fulbright scholarship to do a study linking addiction to uh, you know, mental illness and try to determine how someone would act out and do their addiction with drugs or behavior. And he said the latest research they have on crystal meth is long-term exposure to crystal meth um, removes uh, empathy. And so we we're talking about Nazi Germany. And so I was like, well, so the way they were able to do concentration camps is because they had zapped their empathy out of these soldiers and out of these people because of all the drugs they were giving them. Yeah. And no one ever tells that story. And so I said, you know, would it be a stretch to say that is addiction caused or was one of the biggest causes of World War II? He's like, that's exactly what caused it. But you never hear that story. So going back to when I was sitting, um, I'll tell that story later. I'm actually going to, there's, there's a book called Blitz written about it. There's a movie called High Hitler. You can watch on YouTube. You can watch Hitler's Secret Drug Habit. So I'm not making this up. Anyone wanting to do the research, you can just totally can show evidence that so much of the wars that we have happened under the influence. Napoleon was, you know, on opiates uh, before the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, Winston Churchill drank almost daily to the point of intoxication. We just don't have a lot of records about that. So it's, it's very interesting, you know, how, how, how addiction plays into all these things that we don't realize. So I told the story, I got up and I talked about drugs, but I talked about the sexual stuff. And I said shit that I was ashamed of and, and, and like, oh my God, I'm, I'm about to lose my whole damn business here. And, you know, I'm running a multi-million dollar, you know, organization. And after I was done, the people came up to me and said, yeah, I was abused. I was raped. Um, women. Yeah. I used to be a prostitute. I used to be, I used to work at a, in a strip club. I, you know, I've gotten married to men before because I just needed money and it was, you know, legalized prostitution. And, uh, and it made me realize like, holy shit. Um, I gotta keep talking about this, not because I want to have people look at me like I'm some weirdo that, you know, talks about these things that are done, but it seems to be helping people. So I talked about it a little bit more, talked about it a little bit more. And then all of a sudden, you know, I started seeing the effects of people that were entrepreneurs and realizing, yeah, I work so much because it's the only thing that makes the pain go away. And I don't, I don't feel happy anywhere else. And you realize that addicts are pleasure death. And if you're constantly getting high stimulation, you need more pleasure. And so these men and women that are running around trying to get famous, trying to do big business deals and stuff. They're just trying to scratch the itch. You know, there's a book on workaholism that says the subtitle is workaholism is a respectable addiction. And that's a weird thing about we live in this world where you can exhaust yourself under the guise of, oh, I'm selling stuff. Oh, I'm inspiring people. Oh, I've all these people are following me on social media. So I got to I got to put out content and I got to as, as if they're all waiting for you in their whole life, like you're the almighty that their, their you know, ability to coexist depends on your uh, posting something. Um, but you know what? That's not going away. And so I'm not here to talk down about technology. It's not that technology is good or bad. It's, it's how you use it. You know, there's, uh, and the question is, do you use it? Do you utilize it? Or does it use you? And do you use it to use other people? Or do you utilize it to help other people? And I've met a lot of influencers that just put out dog shit that have the most ridiculous justifications and rationalizations. Oh, that's just my art. You know, and, and artists, like I've hung around a lot of artists since I created Artists for Addicts. I'm actually friends with a couple of the most famous artists in the world. And um, I, you know, it pisses some of them off, but I'm like, I think a lot of art is just pollution. You know, it's just, you can, you can piss on a canvas and crap on a canvas and throw it up on the wall and call it art and say, well, yeah, but that's myself. Great. You know, that's my opinion. Again, I could be wrong. I mean, uh, people that will hate me for what I just said, how dare you not say a piece of shit on a canvas is not art. Um, but the fact is we can rationalize almost anything, including me, right? We can come up with all kinds of stuff. So 
the, the, the thing is, is like, there's, when you really look at your life and what you're doing, you got you to gotta really just ask the question, is it helping other people? Is it making them better? And if it's not, are you okay with doing that? Because every moment of your day that you spend taking from someone versus giving, there's a little part of your soul you have to betray. There's a little part of you that has to betray because you want to make money, because you want to get ahead, because you want to be liked. And the, the, the ego is very seductive. And there's something mysterious and desirable about doing what you shouldn't do and being dangerous. I mean, you know, going out and being kind of a degenerate at times when you're inebriated enough, you can rationalize and it feels really good. That's why we watch, you know, cops and robber movies. And that's why we, you know, watch music videos where, you know, they're glorifying shit that out of that context you get arrested for, right? And so, and, and again, this is not a moral soapbox sort of thing. I'm just talking about it, you know, do whatever the hell you want to do in your life. Just take a look, is, is your life working? Is it not working? And what I learned is that when I, uh, when I hired uh, my yoga instructor, uh, Giselle, uh, who's now my, uh, one of, one of my project managers and executive assistant, I've, I have a couple of different assistants. Uh, and she came to me a few months ago and she's like, you know, she's been doing private yoga with me for almost five years. And she said, you know, I could probably help you with a lot of the stuff. I see a lot of the things that you just need support with. And she sees me in a different place than most people. Um, and this is during the pandemic. And I'm like, well, what do you, what do you mean? Like you've been my yoga instructor. Do you know how to do any of this stuff? She goes, well, I've managed 40 people at the last club I was uh, running. And, um, and I have a business degree and I have a finance degree and she's super sharp. But when I first, so she's, it's working out really well right now. And she had come to me, well, when I was doing private yoga with her, she said, um, I was going through grief because I had a breakup of a relationship. And she said this saying that I'd heard before, but it just landed for some reason when she said it. She said, if you do yoga three times a week, it'll change your body. If you do it every day, it'll change your life. And I said, huh, I wonder what would happen if I did yoga every day because I'm busier than shit. And at that time I'm traveling, like I'm on an airplane every two weeks, I'm running my companies, all this stuff. And I, I made a commitment. I said, I'm gonna do yoga every day for a month and see what happens. And after about two weeks, it something in my body shifted. It just felt like, wow, you know, I mean, I never felt kind of that, but I kept with it. And over a, over a 90 day period, I did, 82 or 83 yoga sessions, not like a 10 minute YouTube video. I'm talking like an hour to 90 minute private or in class sort of thing. And what I learned is that it, it increased just a little bit my ability to respond to life versus react. And that's when it occurred to me when my life is working, I'm responding. When my, when my life is not working, I'm reacting. And when I was in active addiction, I didn't know how to deal with it. I wasn't using the tools of recovery. I didn't even know what they were back then. And now I think of like, okay, how do I respond to this situation? How do I address it? When someone makes me angry, am I going to react or am I going to respond? When I see something that's happening in the world that is fucking appalling to me, am I going to react? Am I going to respond? If I have to meet with someone who's hated like a Harvey, Am I going to react and say, I think you're a piece of shit? Or am I going to try to listen to what is going on and, and, and realize this is a person that has done or been accused of doing very bad things that is terrified of women. And because of that terror, it is manifested in who this person has become. How in the hell does that happen? And when I'm looking at everything from responding versus reacting, I just function better. And I react a lot, but I'm doing my best to respond more and more as I go through life. And I'm wanting to share the story and do the things that I do. So not that I think I'm going to change anyone. I just hope if I say something, it'll give someone perspective. They'll think about it and say, yeah, you know what? I may apply that to my life. That gives me a framing on how to think about it. That gives me some context on how to understand it. And if I do have a hope, I just hope that people can leave listening to anything I've said with a little more compassion not just for others and addicts and stuff, but for themselves. Because if you can become more compassionate for yourself, you can literally sit and really be with things that cause so much pain and so much suffering to yourself that used to control you. And all of a sudden you can say, wow, these things are actually a gift. Every difficult person, every difficult thing, every challenging thing, 
I'm going to use all of this shit that happened in my life as fertilizer in order to grow something versus just complaining and being pissed and thinking that my life sucks. And if you think your life sucks, someone else's life sucks more, go volunteer, go to an animal shelter, go to a homeless shelter, go to a recovery meeting, sponsor somebody, put yourself out there and you will instantly feel better because there's something weird about life. Whenever you like are of service to someone that you can help, I think there's a humanity and there's an energy and there's a connection that cannot be developed any other way. It's not going to be developed by watching videos. It's not going to be developed by talking about it. You, you, you know, you don't build a great reputation by talking about what you're going to do. You build a great reputation by doing stuff. And so you, you know, whenever you're feeling lost, whenever you're feeling hurt, if you can muster, even when you're feeling totally hopeless to go and offer hope, if you don't have any hope, go offer hope to someone that doesn't have any hope. And you know what? Both of you will start growing hope. It will be generated that way. You know, you don't just get recovery because you want it. You get it because you're doing things that create it. Working for it. Yeah. What are, what are some resources that we can, like you've talked about yoga being one of the, um, you know, you know, we talked about set and setting like yoga. I would consider that as like integration, right? There's like integrative, um, uh, practices that we can do after, uh, you know, therapy or what have you, but what are maybe, um, resources that we can share with our audience in terms of, if you have been listening to this conversation, like, Oh, damn, I think I got a little bit of this. I got a little bit of the work thing. I got maybe got a little bit of the sex thing. I got a little bit of the technology thing. Where can, where can people go to find more? Is it the 12 steps? Is there what, tell us in your, like your best recommendations for where people can begin to begin to heal. Okay, so well, for for what I uh, for one is having the understanding. So part of it is edu- like my by my friend Sam Karashi says, education uh, over medication. If you can do that, so uh, twelve steps are great. And what I do like about twelve steps is that they're readily available. And if you can't go in person, uh, there's a lot of online meetings all over the world in every type of of category. Uh, so whatever the addiction is, if you type in you know, Overeaters Anonymous, if you type in sex addict, you know. Uh, you can find it. Uh, I, I created a foundation called Genius Recovery, where we have listings of all kinds of different meanings, geniusrecovery.org or .com. They both go to the same place. Uh, and I wrote an open letter and it gives, and people really like my open letter because it's my viewpoints on, on addiction. And there, it, nothing is sold there. It's literally just a link to uh, videos like with Gabor Mate, different people that, are, that have been recovering addicts. Um, and then there's listings of different meetings, not just 12 steps, but other types of support groups that are free. So it's all available. And then links to different podcasts, many that I don't even know, but people that put out podcasts on that. The only thing that I've ever written that's sold that has anything to do with addiction is a, a book called uh, The Miracle Morning for Addiction Recovery that I did with Hal Elrod and uh, my friend, Anna David, who's written many books on, on addiction. Yesterday, at the time we're doing this, she would celebrate 20 years sober. She's awesome. And so it's, it's, so the morning, we have a whole process for how to create rituals in the morning, which even if you're not a morning person, they still work. So we lay that out. And I also describe, and I've learned everything I've learned, it's through other people that I have learned stuff and help. And I always give these people credit. I, I do my best to take the, the people I've learned from and put their work out into the world because many of the most brilliant people are terrible marketers, but they have these amazing, you know, methodologies in all areas of health, fitness, you know, business, you know, parenting, relationships, et cetera. So uh, there's four things someone needs in order to get sober and stay sober uh, that I have found. Uh, the first is uh, community. No one recovers in isolation. That's where 12 steps come in. What 12 steps don't deal with is trauma work uh, or anything related to health and nutrition. That's why you'll see a lot of people at 12 steps that are eating donuts, guzzling coffee, smoking, chain smoking. But you know, you're dealing with a bunch of addicts, but you got to give 12 steps credit. I mean, it is, it is one of the most useful, you know, has f- saved the lives of millions of people over the, the since the thirties, uh, you know, before AA, people either died, uh, were incarcerated, institutionalized, or they just lived a life of suffering. So poke as many holes as someone wants into it. There's nothing that has helped more addicts than 12 steps. Every rehab center, every inpatient, outpatient therapist, self-help book, self-help speaker, 
combined can't even hold a candle to the amount of people that have been held through help through 12 steps but it's just one part of it so 12 steps is where community comes in because again you don't want to do this in isolation so if you're suffering reach out to 12 steps um, or other types of communities the second is it's biochemical it's serotonin it's dopamine this is not the not that this could ever work it's just it's just in a, you know Metaphorically speaking, if you could stick a syringe into my brain and suck out the dopamine or into my stomach and suck out the serotonin because 70% of serotonin is made in the gut, then all of a sudden I would be in a frantic craving state because I'd want those chemicals back. That's why people do these things. That's why they do the behaviors. That's why all of these people you see on TV that are doing bad shit, if you were to look at the biochemistry of their bodies, they're all messed up. That's why if someone does MDMA guided trauma therapy and it fills their system with dopamine and they're able to talk about traumatic experiences that they couldn't even verbalize without it, it's because they're in that state. And that's how you get it out of their system. That's one of the premises behind the proper use of psychedelics and plant medicines and, and whatnot. So this, so it's biochemical. If, if uh, there's a doctor here that's a friend of mine, David Arneson, and he's treated over 20,000 people that are addicts with uh, IV therapies of uh, amino acids, v, uh, you know, B vitamins, vitamin C. And he said to me when I first met him, he said, if you ever see a homeless toothless addict, like a woman that's smoking crack and shooting heroin that's on the streets pregnant and missing teeth, what you're witnessing is modern day scurvy. I mean, they're just not getting any nutrition. If they're eating anything, it's sodas, junk food, scraps of, I mean, it's just the worst type of nutrition. And he said that if you, their gut is so damaged, they're not even producing any chemicals that allow them to focus or sleep. And they're, they're just in a, their nervous system is a wreck. And if you, if you arrest that person, or if you take that person and put them into a rehab center with the best talk therapist in the world, but you don't fix their gut, they're still going to be in a craving state and they're still going to desire drugs. That's why you see so much drugs in prison is because they're putting people in prison, serving them shitty food, not fixing them nutritionally. And for a fraction of what it would cost to incarcerate and treat some of these people, if they actually balance the biochemistry, which is available, it exists and it costs nothing compared to what it costs to incarcerate these people. And I'm not saying you shouldn't incarcerate criminals. If someone's committed a violent crime, none of this is an excuse for somebody hurting somebody. So I just want to make that clear. Anything that I'm saying is not an excuse for somebody that's going out and hurting people. Uh, you just got to understand why it's happening because you're never going to find a solution if you don't understand why it's happening. So if you can fix it. So I said to him, I go, well, can you treat these people with oral supplementation? He's like, if their gut is so damaged, they won't process it. So that's why we do IVs. And he's like, within a few weeks, I can get some people focusing and sleeping and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's amazing what happens when you buy So the second is biochemical. That's why food, nutrition, drinking water, and then all of the things that supplement it, which is in the third category, which is the underlying trauma work. The issues are in the tissues. That's where breathing, meditation, yoga, EMDR, the proper use of plant medicine, somatic therapy, not just talk therapy, but getting into the body. Something I really think human happiness is the flow state. My friend, Stephen Kotler, who's done a tremendous amount of research on flow, even uh, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, the very first author of the book, Flow, the Psychology of Achievement said, you know, uh, the the same neural pathways that the world's greatest athletes, entertainers, achievers use to achieve great things are the same neural pathways that addicts use for self-destruction. So we're using the same roads. Why do some people do great things and other people, their lives go off the rails, right? So a lot of this is it's the underlying trauma work. So getting into a flow state, whatever puts you there, being with an animal, anything that allows you to feel connected to nature, hiking, what, whatever allows you to connect. And, and that's usually not anything that happens after midnight. That's usually not looking at a computer screen all day or looking at a phone or, you know, being engulfed in a video game or, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm literally funding the development of a VR company while I'm on a sabbatical and we're going to use VR for ways to create immersive experiences that people can actually live through their, what happens if I stay up till three in the morning watching porn? What happens if I have that affair? What happens if I gamble my, you know, kids college fund away? What happens if I cheat? What if happens, you know, and so I want people to not just hear about it, but immersively experience it because 
there are some companies that I'm working with that have done amazing things with reducing stress and angst through, through, through a VR experience. But the, the flip side of it is most of those things are going to be used for blood sports, uh, porn, all that sort of stuff. So these, these technologies are not going away. So there are ways to get people to physically uh, get into the body and, and do stuff. Most of it is not going to come through technology. And if it does, great, but I wouldn't rely on it. I mean, you, you got to be a human. We are humans. We're not right. built for the type of shit that we're subjecting ourselves to. That's why you see so much addiction with, with electronics. Yep. I mean, addiction is a massive facilitator for gambling addicts. Okay. And then the, the fourth is the environment, um, which is uh, based on the studies from Bruce Alexander, who said, um, you know, I, I've talked to with him on the phone. He's agreed to be in one of my documentaries. He's the one that did the rat park studies. Oh, that yeah. People talk about. So he yeah. lives in Canada. I'm happy to introduce you to him. And he uh, basically in the seventies, he looked at these studies they had started, I believe in the fifties and you give a, put a rat in a cage, give them the choice between drugged water, and regular water. They would drink, they would take the drug water over food, over sex, over sleep until they died. So he created, he's like, what would happen if we put them in a more conducive environment, not isolated in a cage. And when you put them in a, in, in rat park with other rats, other sex that they could have, you know, blue balls, red balls, make it like rat paradise, drug water, regular water, the rats wouldn't drink the, the drug water. And then he got, the, he's like, well, what if they got quote unquote addicted? So they gave these rats drugs for, I think it was like 30 days, 60 days, and they put them back in rat park. And even after quote unquote being addicted, they still wouldn't drink the drug water unless they were traumatized, right? So Gabor Mate says, if you wanted to create the perfect system to keep someone addicted, you'd create the prison system we have in America even though he's a Canadian, because 25% of the world's prisoners are in the United States. We're the highest incarcerating country in the world. And we're in, we're in addiction is a modern form of slavery. So those four areas, uh, so it's uh, community, uh, it's food, nutrition, biochemical, it's the underlying trauma work, and it's the environment. And if you set up your life to focus on those four areas, that's going to give you the highest possibility. And I would also say, even if you're not an addict, if you look at those four areas of life, community, biochemical, you know, getting into a flow state, you know, and then creating a, a, an environment more critical now than ever, because we have to create environments because look at, I mean, it's a new world. And so we have this cultural reaction that you see going on. Of course, when everyone's reacting, they're going to do crazy shit. So anyway, I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I know you actually have an appointment that you either need to reschedule or we need to keep rolling here but uh, i want to be cognizant of, of time because as as i mentioned three times now i can babble a lot no you've done a really great job and i wanted to make sure that we get the resources uh for our listeners and i will make sure that we do that and i uh, I just, I always, I just want to say like, I always enjoy like anytime I get to connect with you, this has been so wonderful. And, you know, in just in terms of what you're saying, like community is my immunity. Like there's, you yeah. know, there's, if there's been a way that I have, you know, in some ways my podcast has been a blessing because I've been able to connect with, you know, I wouldn't have otherwise had a two and a half hour conversation with you, you know, if we didn't have an appointment for it. So, uh, really, really grateful for, um, for, for you. And just again, you speak about some of these horrors that you have endured with such transparency. And, you know, I think anyone listening is going to understand that you were not doing it from a place of like, oh, woe is me and come buy my book and come join my, like, I don't think you're doing it. It comes across very clearly that you are trying to help other people. And I know that Giovanni has said multiple times to me that he would not be in the place that he is if it wasn't for uh, Genius Network, if it wasn't for, you know, the mentoring and the people that he's met through, you know, either directly from you or from the people that you've introduced him to in Genius. So um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you and, and acknowledge your brilliance, your vulnerability. And I, I know that this is going to be well received by the people who listen to it. Well, let me say one last thing. You're welcome to take this out if you want, because I don't ever want to uh, pitch something, uh, even though people do that all the time. I, I have a book called Life Gives to the Giver. It's free. It's on joesfreebook.com. And I believe that if people just go out and give, that's how life gives back to you is, is life gives to the giver. And, and, and it doesn't put someone into a subscription thing. It doesn't put someone into an upsell. It literally is just a really good book and it's free and people can download it. And if they want the physical version, they can pay for shipping and handling. But beyond that, it's a free book. And I talk about addiction. I talk about different thoughts and philosophies. And yeah, and for resources, Genius Recovery is where I list resources. And, uh, you know, I always say people 
stick with where you're learning from. So if someone really likes your stuff, don't go out. You're you're better off mastering somebody's work than trying to read a hundred books. You know, you're better off to master one book than read fifty books. And so, uh, I think what you're doing, Stephanie, is is amazing. Putting it out into the world, and it was uh, my pleasure to be here and talk with you today. Thank you so much, Dr. Stephen Gundry. Is the video that's coming up next for you? Just click right here. We're talking about the microbiome, energy, postbiotics, mitochondria, and how to get your energy back. Continuous ketosis, 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year is really dumb. 